Hey there, Internet. I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And Mac has been taken by the darkness today. <laughs> and this is I Will Fight You, a podcast where we've been turning opinion into stone cold facts since 1986. Today's fact, more video games need musical interludes. <laughs> We are here today to talk about something that is vaguely timely, but also like 13 years old. So, you know, bear with us here. We are going to be talking about the Alan's Wake and Control, the Remedy Connected Universe, I guess is what they're going with. And in order to do that, we have brought on friend of the show, Jake Mason. Hi, Jake. Hello. Thanks for having me. I love the Remedy Controlled Universe. Control, remedy, control, remedy connected. What was it? What did you just say a minute ago? Remedy integrated video gaming. I love the works of Sam Lake and all of his friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 Sam Lake and pals. Yeah. Right at the top of the show, let's get a couple content warnings out of the way. This is going to be like horror games e sort of. They like to talk about how dark they are, and sometimes that's a physical darkness, and sometimes it's an emotional darkness. Yeah, there's a lot of both. Yeah. It's a game of metaphors, you see. <laughs> so, content warnings right off the bat. Things that will come up. Drowning, suicide, sort of. Depression, child death, sort of. <laughs> and also the shittiest cop novels you've ever read. He's so bad at writing. <laughs> He's He's a bad writer. He's so bad at it. We will be having spoilers here for, in particular, Alan Wake, Alan Wake 2, and Control, if that matters to you. We'll be paying lip service to the Max Payne games, to Quantum Break, and to Alan Wake's American Nightmare, because I haven't played those. I've played two of the three Max Paynes and Alan Wake's American Nightmare. I know of quantum break and there's a very confusing thing as to how it got made and that's pretty much all i yeah and why it's hard to find it's basically impossible to play the whole game now (laughs) because of the way it was made we'll get into that a little bit um but obviously jake and i have both played these games kit i believe you have played nothing from these guys exactly none of them i'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) excellent Great. So we're basically going to be doing like kind of a rehash of when we had Shannon on years ago to talk about Kingdom Hearts. (laughs) (laughs) Before we start, Kit, do you know anything about Alan Wake or Control? Like, what do you know about those games? I know Alan Wake is kind of a Stephen King-ish thing about a guy who's a writer who is in a creepy town. I think there's a flashlight involved. I'm vaguely remembering that, I think. There is. Good. Control, I believe, is the... F- not SLC. <laughs> Salt Lake City. <laughs> it's the SLC <laughs> punk of video games, if you think about yeah, it. Yes, the SLC. It's the SLC punk video game. No. SCP? God. SCP. It's kind of like an SCP kind of thing, and that's about all I know about Control. Okay. okay. You know what? I feel like that's a good base to start with. Yeah. That's all correct information that you've listed thus far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> okay. So a little background. These are all video games that are made by Remedy Entertainment, which was founded in 95. They are a Finnish studio, and they will never let you forget that they are from Finland. It- Don't you ever forget. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> they are Finnish till they die. <laughs> Like, there's this whole thing where it was recently pointed out that there's a map of the surrounding locale of ostensibly Washington State in Alan Wake 2. And, oh, what's this? Let's overlay a map of the Baltic Sea. And, oh, (laughs) yep. Uh, The funniest part about them being Finnish is that I didn't know that at all until I was playing Control and there is a very prominent Finnish character in it and the where I live in New Hampshire has a huge Finnish population. No kidding. There's like three areas in the US where there's just like it's chock a block with Finns. It's southern New Hampshire, South Carolina, and somewhere in either Oregon or Washington. I don't know which one is on top. I think that's Washington. I think it's that one. Yeah, because I showed Mac one of the things that we'll be talking about today. And I was like, I guess there's just a little Finland in Washington. And we look it up and it's like, I maybe. Yeah. Because we do have like a lot of Scandinavians in yeah. like the Seattle area. My friend's mom is from Washington. So and she is Finnish. And then she moved over here to the other second homeland, <laughs> uh, southern New Hampshire. So they basically just picked an ocean. Pretty much. To cross. 
Yeah. yeah. So I didn't know that. And then all of a sudden there's a finished character and I'm like, what? This is because I you never hear about him in media. No. And I was like, well, weird. I got to tell my friend Leighton about this. Where did they come up with this character? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's 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 Finland. He's Finnish. He's a Finn. He's just Finland, the man. <laughs> He's just Finland, the man. Like, you've heard of Portugal, the man? <laughs> this is Finland, the man. <laughs> Oh, that's what Yotanyo is. Uh, <laughs> the man, the song. They got their start, like their big splash was making the Max Payne video games, which I never, you, you shoot things in those? Yeah, it's. There's, there's bullet time, as I recall, with those. Ah. The big thing was bullet time. Yeah, it was like the first use of bullet time in a video game. It was basically like the whole promotion of it was like, you can play a John Woo movie. And that was sort of the long and short of it. It was also of the era where a video game having a story at all was impressive. Yeah, I yeah. remember hearing that like for Max Payne 2, it was like Sam Lake was the writer for that. And it was like, he actually like went to school to go learn how to write things and studied noir novels and stuff. And people were like, they added a story to this? <laughs> You mean they didn't just get the one programmer who took a poetry class to do all the dialogue? Right. Oh, oh, no, they got, no, well, maybe, actually. <laughs> In this case, it's the same guy. <laughs> it's the same yeah. guy did both things. It's the same guy. I feel like I'm remembering the terrible movie more than the video game where there was like a drug that made you see angels and demons. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you would take a drug, and the way it would make you high was that you saw the war between angels and demons. And I don't know if they were real or not. I cannot remember. It's not a good movie. Like, like you just started playing Diablo in the middle of yeah, in the middle of this. The other thing I remember about Max Payne is that it is the first instance of Remedy's favorite thing, which is having your characters watch a little TV show while you're <laughs> playing a video game. And there was one called Lords and Ladies that was like, I guess, kind of like proto Bridgerton, if I'm remembering correctly. Oh my god. Yes, fantastic. Was it also live action? No, this one was, there might have been live action, but it was like pictures on a TV that were moving. It wasn't like any sort of mm -hmm. video. I don't think they did live action stuff until maybe Quantum Break. Yeah, they got a little bit close to it with like looping GIFs in Alan Wake. Having things play on a video screen in a video game is a nightmare for various technical design and technical art reasons. Right, but Remini Entertainment was like, we're doing it, though. This is going to be our thing. <laughs> we are going to get this right someday, goddammit. Remedy Entertainment has been single-handedly bringing back FMV in video games for no reason, really. For no reason <laughs> other than Sam Lake was the face of Max Payne in the first video game. It's just like they took a picture of his face, stuck it on the character model because it was 2001. And then <laughs> now he gets to just play Max Payne sort of in games. And I think that that was sort of him just being like, I want to be really Max Payne for real. And here's the thing. It's like Sam Lake has that kind of face. He has a face that looks oh. like some kind of grizzled noir detective. A jagged face this man has. Yeah. So it's just kind of a waste to not take a picture of this thing. Right. Look, here's the thing. Sam Lake is one of the guys we're going to be talking about a lot today because he basically has big like Hideo Kojima energy where he just wants to make silly little video games with all his friends. Yeah. He's been a story writing screenplay guy for like most of Remedy's games in some capacity. Creative director for some of the more recent ones. Again, also like a mocap guy. And here's the thing. This freaky little Finn, I kind of love him. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. We also have to talk about a different bunch of Freaky Little Fins, which is the Finnish rock band Poets of the Fall. Uh, yep. They're going to show up a lot, so we probably should talk about them. A lot, actually. Okay. I have heard of Poets of the Fall. I am dying to know how they tie into all this. Several ways. <laughs> It turns out that Marco Soresto, who is the lead vocalist, is basically just like BFFs with Sam Lake. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> They've just yeah. known each other like for a long time. I think they're like high school buddies. Everybody in Finland is high school buddies with everybody else in <laughs> Finland. It's not a big country. <laughs> right. So do you remember earlier when you were talking about the one programmer who took a poetry class? Oh, no. <laughs> I looked this up. During the development of Max Payne 2, Sam Lake hangs out with Marco and hands him a poem that he wrote. And he's like, can you make this into a song? And they're like, absolutely. 
And it's used as the ending theme for Max Payne 2. Apparently a bunch of characters like hum and whistle it during the game itself. And people liked it. And even like one of the audio engineers from Remedy joined Poets of the Fall, like (laughs) on the reg. That's wonderful. Sam Lake bringing people together with his poetry. (laughs) With his dorky little poetry for the shooty video game. (laughs) And then Sam Lake is like, I've gotten a taste for it. I'm going to do this forever now. I'm going to just keep putting my friend Marco's band into my little video games. <laughs> and it's in like increasingly, it's not them. They're played by different people, but the band is in two games. It's in the Alan Wake games as a different band. <laughs> yeah, there is an in-universe band that Poets of the Fall is. And Poets of the Fall also is in this universe as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what happens when this other band opens for Poets of the Fall or vice versa in this fictional reality we've created? (laughs) Well, when they perform it in real life, they do cosplay as the characters from the fake band. Oh my god, yes. Which they've done on more than one occasion. Sometimes just for fun. Yeah. And Poets of the Fall in-universe might be... Like a ghost, like like a like a spiritual like band of ghosts. Like they might be otherworldly <laughs> entities, but a band. It's a little hard to tell. Yeah, because like there's definitely a point where there's like a radio host. He's like, "Here's this new band called Poets of the Fall, and gosh, they just remind us all of our old friends, the other band, the old gods of Asgard that we love so much, and everyone knows." Listen, won't we? But then there's also like a couple parts in Control where like the band Poets of the Fall has songs in the game, but they didn't record this in the game. Like they didn't like in the universe, the band Poets of the Fall could not have possibly recorded in this manner to put these things in these places. It's very strange. Yeah. Sam like just likes his best friend Marco's band. It's admirable. I can't claim I would do differently under the circumstances, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It's just like how Kojima is like, I want to put my friend Guillermo del Toro in this game. Yeah. And then he did that. And <laughs> so, but Sam Lake just does that with his band friends. Or I've got a crush on Moss Michelson, so I'm going to create this staggering work of art specifically for him to be in. <laughs> uh, he's not going to understand a single thing about it, though. <laughs> well, Mads Mikkelsen is not alone <laughs> in that regard, I guess. <laughs> We know about Sam Lake now. We know about Pose of the Fall. Let's talk about Alan Wake, which is definitely confusing that it's Alan Wake by Sam Lake. Yeah, that's not... I don't like that. That's just his pen name, too. Is it? He just chose that, and he's like, I'm going to make a video game about a man called Alan Wake, and it sounds like my name, because it's like, (laughs) A-Wake, like awake, like you're asleep. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it can't be... It's got to be on purpose. It can't be an accident. It's definitely like his self-insert character, I feel like. But yes. I also feel like Sam Lake is not like Alan Wake in almost any way. No, <laughs> he just, not He just at likes all. this idea a lot, and so he made him a video game. Yeah, he's definitely not an OC or anything. Yeah. I maintain my point from the last episode that when writers write about writers, it's always the worst <laughs> shit in the entire world. Yes. It, it yes, is. it is. <laughs> Alan Wake is, and in like we have to take the fact that in-universe, he's a very popular writer to mean that in the world of alan wake he's good but in the real world he's <laughs> so bad he is so bad at writing <laughs> it's like the worst you've ever heard i almost think that he might actually be an incredibly mediocre writer in universe it's just that people have shit taste he sells great at airports <laughs> like we just don't hear about that yeah exactly this man writes airport books yeah i that i would believe yeah like you know tom clancy published something like 50 novels many of them posthumously so yeah yeah so here's the thing about alan wake this video game character has two actors one of them he has a face actor who is a you'll never believe it a finn <laughs> named ilka Vili, and he is voice acted by matthew peretta and Increasingly, as the series goes on, they will start taking advantage of this. Oh, God. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew Preda is very good, by the way. He's super good. He also will appear. Once we get to control, he just stay tuned. <laughs> you'll, you'll maybe appear again. Remedy has this thing where they basically like when they started making video games on a budget, they basically just had like a very small stable and just kept reusing people. And then they decided to lean in on that and make that a thing. 
And then you're basically sitting there trying to like, it's like how in Into the Woods, Cinderella's Prince is traditionally played by the same actor who portrays the big bad wolf. So you're like sitting there trying to ascribe meaning to be like, this character is voiced by someone who voices a character in another video game. What does it mean? And it just means that like, that's their buddy. And yeah. <laughs> and he, like, they like working together. Yeah. And they at no point did these two characters have to be in the same scene. Well, they recently did a performance, like there's a song that comes up, speaking of musicals, that Andy may have alluded to at the top of the show. Yeah. They do a performance at the Game Awards, and like he can sing and be dancing at the same time because it's two different guys. <laughs> so one of the guys is over there singing. Yeah, yeah. Matthew Perrette is just off, like, on stage left. Like, yeah. down stage left, while Ilka Billy is mouthing along to the words and dancing. <laughs> and just dancing, doing his best dancing. Everyone doing that dance is just... <laughs> Giving it their all. God bless them. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We we gotta we gotta get to that beautiful shining moment. We gotta get through some other video games first. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah, there's quite a ways to go between the two. Okay, okay. So Alan Wake was released in 2010. Oh god. And it is an extremely 2010 video game. It got a re-release, like a remaster, a couple of years ago. I only played this last year. Yeah, it was within the last two years, I think, the remaster came out. It's it's very recent. And I know it because Shannon Maynor, former guest right. of this show and my co-host on Kingdom Smarts, she got into it and then went through the whole thing. And then like as soon as she was done playing it, they announced Alan Wake 2. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. I've been waiting 13 <laughs> years. You don't have to experience the long, stupid wait that I've had to do. The second you get into it, they're like, hey, Shannon, you want another one? Here you go. It's coming out in, <laughs> in the fall. I feel like this is cosmic balance for Shannon having to wait that long for Kingdom Hearts 3. Probably. You know, I, I'll accept that. Yeah, honestly. She deserves that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Alan Wake. What you have to know is that when Alan Wake was like seven years old and he was a tiny little terrible writer, <laughs> he was super afraid of the dark. He had night terrors and his mom basically used like some Discworld headology that a witch would approve of. She was like, OK, here's an old busted ass light switch that's like not on a power cord anymore. It's the magic clicker. The clicker. <laughs> The clicker! <laughs> and we're going to take the words the clicker very seriously for the next several games. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Basically, it's like, you click this and it defeats the darkness, Alan. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to be obsessed about this. <laughs> <laughs> and then instead of writing anything really scary, he writes cop novels. I feel like <laughs> he would have had a really good grounding to write some good horror books but he wanted to write about max Payne instead so he did that yeah yeah book one alex casey that's the name of the character alex casey like a case yeah book two <laughs> what i can't forget book three return to sender book four the things that i want book five the fall of casey and then book six the sudden stop he wrote six shitty cop novels and the world ate them up yeah, the airports could not keep them in stock. <laughs> they see, they even sound like airport novels. Yeah. They look like airport novels, too. Yeah. Uh, what I love, so the other thing is that Alex Casey is literally Max Payne. Yeah. Because Max Payne was made by Remedy and whoever published it had the rights to it. They couldn't use Max Payne. So he made up second Max Payne, Alex Casey. <laughs> But it is still, when we do see him, it is Sam Lake's face. And then there is a whole bit about how, like, there's a real Alex Casey who people were like, oh, just like the novels. He's like, that's a coincidence. But that guy is played by Sam Lake. His face is played by Sam Lake. His voice is voiced by the guy who voiced Max Payne. Yeah. I am dying to know how Alan Wake describes bullet time in his novels. <laughs> Uh, I wish I could read it. Well, Alan belabors over every single moment. Imagine yeah. like someone writing noir who thinks that noir just basically consists of it's dark and it's raining and I'm grumpy about it. Yeah. The prose reads like if you don't read it with a grumbly voice, it will sound wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great, because if you find pages of this story, Alan Wake will read them aloud. And Matthew Perrette is not, he's not doing a dark, grumbly voice. No, he's just like a guy. He's just being Matthew Perretta. Yeah, he's just like a guy. 
But the thing is that the world loves these books. And here's the conceit is the idea is that that means that he gets to go on talk show after talk show and go to big fancy New York City parties and do lots of drugs and have the paparazzi take lots of pictures of him. He's like a rock star writer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is perhaps a 30 years out of date understanding of what it is to be a best selling writer. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I, yeah yep. that's that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're about to get about 100 years out of date because then oh no, Alan Wake decides that he's tired of all of it. So he wants to kill off Alex Casey in the last book, The Sudden Stop, because it's like he's Agatha Christie or Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> but a lot like Arthur Conan Doyle, it doesn't take. In that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And everyone's like, we want to read about Alex Casey again. He's like, I killed him. I can't write about it. And they're like, OK, what's your next book? And he's like, I have no clue. I can't tell you what the next one's going to be about. <laughs> I only have shitty cop novels in me. He gets writer's block for two years. <laughs> From 2008 to 2010, he gets writer's block because he can't think of anything else besides <laughs> shitty cop novels. <laughs> <laughs> Just do shitty cop novels about a slightly different character, my guy. <laughs> Nobody will notice. They really won't. I mean, that's sort of the whole conceit of Remedy Games. Like, this is just the same guy, but different. Like, just lean into it, Alan. <laughs> At some point, Alan also got married to a beautiful, talented woman named Alice Wake. Oh, no. Yeah. She's a photographer. And over the course of the first game, she will not be wearing pants. Nope. Because of plot reasons, supposedly. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's very important plot reasons. Yeah. yeah. It's important because... Shut up. <laughs> What is she wearing instead of pants? Oh, you know. Oh, just her undies. She's in her skivvies. Tank top and underwear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Terrific. Yeah. yeah. She's 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 beautiful. She's understanding. She's creative. She's the only person. She is doomed. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Extremely doomed. She's the only person who has ever looked at Alan and was like, honey, maybe don't. <laughs> Sweetheart. Have you considered not doing lots of drugs and going to sex parties because you write cop novels? <laughs> Have you considered just not wallowing in self-pity and just trying to write another fucking book for once? Just knock something out at all. Literally anything, honey. She's like a great photographer, too. Like, in universe, yeah. she's like a sought-after photographer. So clearly she's doomed. <laughs> she's very doomed. Yep. She's like, oh, honey. We need to get away from New York City, which, Lucas, you're just going to have to put New York City in here <laughs> because it's just in my head. <laughs> New York City. Thanks, Matthew Berry. We'll never be able to pronounce anything properly ever again. Oh. First, he ruined the word buddy for everybody. <laughs> and then New York City. This man needs to be stopped. Am I devious? Yes, I think I am. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, Lucas, you're probably going to have to use a lot of Garth Marenghi drops in here. <laughs> Garth Marenghi is Alan Wake. Like, Alan Wake and Garth Marenghi are kindred spirits. <laughs> yeah, Alan Wake, I would totally believe Alan Wake sitting in a typewriter and calling himself a Dreamweaver plus actor. <laughs> oh, God. Now I'm just going to be picturing Alan Wake as Garth Marenghi throughout the description of this game. Yes. You know, everyone has a special talent. Mine is being able to write, produce, direct act paint other people are good plumbers that's their gift if you were to tell me that on alan wake's list of favorite authors like number one with a bullet was garth Marenghi, i would believe you i wouldn't question it for a second <laughs> here's the current physical description of alan wake hoodie with a tweed jacket with patches on the elbows over it oh no and spiked tips it's 2010 baby does he have frosted tips in the first one i remember Maybe, okay, okay, they're not frosted, I guess. Because I know his hair is different in the second one, but I don't remember how it was different in the, for the first one. He's got spiky 2010 hair. Yeah. He's got short, spiky 2010 hair, and it's the worst. All I'm seeing is the remastered version, who I suspect is more boring than the original version. Mm, I don't know, Sam Lake loves his friend Matthew Ferretta. <laughs> and his friend Ilkavilli. Ilkavilli, who gets to play like three different characters over the course of the games. Yeah. He's just such a douchebag. And Alice is like, honey, how about we go on vacation to beautiful Washington State? 
somewhere. Beautiful, <laughs> tropical, scenic, <laughs> Bright Falls, Washington. Not Finland. It's definitely not Finland. I don't care what you've heard. It's not Finland. <laughs> I get the feeling they were just like, what biome can we send this guy to in North America that is reasonably similar to Finland? <laughs> yeah, that has to be it. Because like, there's also, and I don't think this comes up a ton in the first game, but in the second one, they're like, oh yeah, Bright Falls was settled by Finnish people. Yep. And so there's like a lot of Finnish like stuff there. But I don't think that's a major thing until they decide to lead into it because everyone loves character from Control who is Finnish. <laughs> Yeah, they're just like, oh, you know, it's like, it's Bright Falls. It's Bright Falls, Washington. You have to come in on a ferry because you're coming from the, the, the San Juans, the the Sound, I, the <laughs> peninsula, of Finland. Look, they don't live there. It's a fjord. We're not going to call it that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're coming in from the Baltic Sea. Don't worry about it. Speaking of Bright Falls, there's one other part of Alan's, I guess, resume. Oh, yeah. That is tangentially related. There was a TV show that was not The Twilight Zone called Night Springs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he wrote for that for a little bit, either after his first book or before his first book. But it was something that he worked on. It was a TV show that was not The Twilight Zone. Yeah, he wrote some episodes. We've seen some scripts. We've seen like episodes of Night Springs are going to be like a collectible in Alan Wake. So you'll see like one or two of his yeah. So is this like just straight up an anthology series? Yes. Yeah. Okay. With a name like Night Springs, you'd think it was a Twin Peaks ripoff instead. Oh, no, that's just the rest of the video game. Oh, terrific. That's most of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And then they it nestled inside of Twin Peaks is not <laughs> the Twilight Zone. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that will come up later. Don't worry about it. As written by not Stephen King. Yeah. So... Bright Falls, though. Bright Falls is a... Do you get it? Bright Falls, Night Springs. Do you, do you get it? Ish. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. They're opposites, you see. And they both involve water. One goes up, one goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Like poetry, it rhymes. <laughs> There's also this cool psychiatrist, psychologist, evil mental health professional in town. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who has a retreat. And he specializes in artists. Alice definitely hasn't been emailing him. Don't worry about it, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coincidence. It's a wild happenstance. Just, I guess, run with it. Totally normal. It's fine. Now that we're in town, Alan, darling, love of my life, let's go to the diner and pick up the key for our Airbnb in 2010. Because they're going to a little cabin. They're going yep. to a little cabin out in the woods near beautiful Cauldron Lake where everything normal happens. The cabin is also on like a cliff. <laughs> like it is it is like the most precarious place in town, too. It's on like a little partial island on the lake, which, by the way, is a caldera because, you know, Pacific, you got the Pacific Rim going on all over Washington. But there's a, you know, it's a volcano. It's a little lake and a volcano and a little island on a lake and a volcano that you have to reach via rickety bridge. <laughs> yeah, I know this is probably is not where this story is going, but hey, my clinically depressed, writer's blocked, famous writer husband, let's go to this incredibly precarious situation. <laughs> like It feels like she was checking the will right before she planned this trip. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's been emailing the lawyer and the psychologist for sure. <laughs> In any other game or situation, I would believe that, but Alice Wake is too good of a person. <laughs> Yeah. She's like the only good person in this video game. Which is how you know that she's in danger. She's very much in danger. <laughs> okay, so it's not that situation where a character is so nice, you're like, they have to be evil. <laughs> no, it like she stands out because you're like, oh no, something terrible is going to happen to you. You're the only person without skeletons in their closet. You're like the only reasonable person here. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, they go by a fun little diner where there's weird waitresses and they're definitely serving, like, cherry pie or something, because, you know. Twin Peaks. Yeah, you, you twin, do a Twin, twin Peaks. Peaks. Yeah. Yeah. Alan gets the key to their little Airbnb from the scariest old lady imaginable who's just lurking <laughs> in, like, a darkened closet <laughs> at the back of the diner. That's just it's what it's like booking an Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> He gets the key from the lamp lady, right? No, the lamp lady's just also there, and she, okay, she gives okay. him an ominous warning about darkness. Oh, great. 
So you know the log lady from Twin Peaks? I haven't seen Twin Peaks, but even I know about the log lady. So there's a lamp lady in this one, and it's just the log lady <laughs> from Twin Peaks, but she has a lamp instead of a log. Oh, for God's sake. Because darkness. Because of, of darkness. He also there meets two old men named Tor and Odin. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were in a band. They were in a band <laughs> called the Old Gods of Asgard. Mm-hmm. And they might sound familiar to you if you know of Poets of the Fall. <laughs> But now they're old men who love the coconut song. <laughs> yeah! Are you serious? Coconut again? You disgust me. You put the lime in the coconut, drink them both up. Oh, right. I almost forgot. We actually have a video game tutorial while Alan Wake is sleeping on the ferry where he's being chased by a character he killed off in one of his books. And there's like a man and a, a mysterious man in an old timey diving suit full of light giving him a video game tutorial. Yeah. Oh, for God's sake. Totally normal stuff. Having a great time. <laughs> normal stuff to happen. <laughs> anyway, so they get up to this incredibly precarious little cabin. And Alice is immediately like, let me get comfortable by taking off my pants. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> and also, surprise, I set you up a little typewriter in here in case you felt like maybe, you know, not being in New York City and maybe just trying, trying anything. Just try. Anything, Alan. <laughs> just try. Just try. Just try instead of just like drink and feel bad. What about try? He doesn't appreciate this gesture, as you might imagine. <laughs> No, I imagine he's a huge shit about it. Yes. Yes, yeah. he is. Because he just sort of storms out and then the lights go out because it's a shitty little cabin. But Alice is also deathly afraid of the dark. Yeah. <laughs> Which seems like a weird coincidence to me, but. It's funny. It's funny how things work. And then Alice is like, oh, whoops. Maybe I shouldn't be a hissy little shit to my wife. <laughs> he runs back into the house because Alice is screaming now. And, oh, hey, there's that there's that scary lady who gave you a room key. <laughs> and she drags Alice into the lake. And Alan is just like, uh-oh, and then dives in the lake, which he's afraid of the dark. And I feel like if you're afraid of the dark, that has to come a little bit with a being afraid of being underwater, where it's also very dark. But Yeah, especially at night in the middle of the woods. Yeah, he doesn't even have the clicker on him right now, I don't think. So he's doomed. No. He's absolutely doomed. He dives in and then he wakes up in a car and it's been a week. Alan's been up to some normal stuff in the last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're about to find out he did some fucked up shit in the last week, didn't we? Mm. Well, yes, but also maybe it wasn't him, as it will turn out. Yeah. I think we do find out that there is a book now. I don't know if that's now or if that's later. We're in this nebulous part of gameplay. Yeah. Yeah, there is a new book. There's a book called Return. Alan keeps finding pages from it scattered hither and yon. And hmm, it seems to be about a writer named Alan in <laughs> the town of Bright Falls and all of these fun characters and things called Taken that are trying to kill him. They're like shadow, like just like walking around shadow guys sometimes, but they're also like possessed people. The video game part of this is that you have to use a flashlight to hurt them before you shoot real people with a gun. Yeah. And also, the main gameplay crux of Alan Wake is that Alan is a writer and very out of shape and cannot run for more than 15 <laughs> feet at a time. <laughs> he does a light jog and then his stamina bar runs out. And he's just like, <gasps> <He's gasps> fully depleted. So he spends the majority of this game just sucking wind. Yes. Yeah. There are parts where it's like you got to run like past a guy or you can fight them or if you like run past him and then like get into like a door or whatever. But it's like if you are two steps farther away than you should be, you will not make it to the door before you have to stop and huff and puff until you get your air back <laughs> while ghouls are throwing like sickles at you and stuff. The remaster added a lot of very generous auto saves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is something compelling about a video game where the difficulty factor comes from the fact that the character you're playing sucks. Yeah, and it's deeply unclear whether or not that's the intention. Yeah. Um, because it could be. It could be because he is a writer who spent the last two years going to Hollywood sex and drug parties and not exercising, <laughs> I imagine. Or sleeping in a big bed with his wife. <laughs> but also, maybe it's just that like it was 2010 when the game came out and... It's a horror game, so you have to be kind of bad at getting away from the monsters to make it scarier. 
So it could go either way. Also, Flashlight is brought to you by Energizer in the original game. Oh, was it? Oh, God. They got rid of it for the remaster. Oh. Yeah, every battery is an Energizer brand battery. Like, no. It might be Duracell. Like, it was one of the big two, but it was like literally the product placementist thing I've ever seen. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Duracell, for keeping <laughs> for... me alive. I seem to vaguely remember that when the game first came out and a bunch of reviewers were like, by the way, did you know this game is sponsored by Duracell? <laughs> yeah. The way the game works is like you point a flashlight and when you're just using the flashlight, it's fine. But if you want to use the flashlight to like get rid of the darkness protecting the Taken so you can shoot them with a gun, you flashlight them harder and that just sucks the energy <laughs> right out of the battery so you have to go find more batteries so the entire game you are constantly finding duracell brand batteries <laughs> all over the oh place my God. this one's in a toolbox it is a resource this one's in someone's desk this one's next to a tractor and it's just a box of duracell <laughs> batteries <laughs> Nobody in the world ever buys another brand of battery. <laughs> no, they can't. They don't sell them here. It only Duracell, <laughs> they corner the market on Bright Falls as far as batteries goes. But also, if I were Duracell and I put my product in a game about how my battery runs out all the time and you got to find more, I would maybe have some mixed feelings about it. Man, did Duracell sponsor Deerfest? Maybe. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> There's also a local festival that's going to be happening in like a week that everybody's excited about called Deerfest. It is a parade <laughs> with deer in it, like f floats. Yeah. But it's like the only thing anybody in Bright Falls lives for. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing this town does. Are they celebrating deer hunting season? Unclear. Yeah, maybe okay. it could be. That makes more sense than them just being like, yeah, deer. <laughs> but also maybe they just like deer. It's hard to tell. Yeah, I think you can find some documents that mention that they have a rival town called Watery down the water and they have a moose fest there. <laughs> and we hate moose fest. No, f*** that. I want to go to moose fest. I feel cheated. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We'll get there. It's a week later, Deerfest is almost here, and Alan Wake now has a flashlight and a gun, and he's going to wander blindly through the woods at night, but they made this, first off, broke it down into six episodes, which were not released episodically, just all at once. And, well, the level design is... They wanted to make an open world game, but it was 2010, so... No. Yeah. You run in the direction the arrow points you. There's a lot of running in the woods, but but you can only be on the trail, you know, like, <laughs> hey, the open world is right over there. If only you could make it over this small wall, but you can't. So you might as well stay on the path. <laughs> Sorry, Alan, you don't have the energy or the athleticism to get <laughs> over the small stone wall. It can't be done. <laughs> Sorry, bud. Oh, you know, hey, here's a consolation prize. You can wander off into this dark part of the woods for a while. Is there anything <laughs> over there? No. There might be a Duracell battery. Or a collectible thermos. <laughs> there were a lot of thermos. But if you meander around too long, more dudes will start trying to kill you. Yeah. So how about that path? How about that? How about that path <laughs> with occasional lights on it? Also, the weird part about Alan Wake is that I remember it coming out in 2008. I thought it came out way earlier than it did, but it didn't. It is a very 2008 video game. It came out in 2010. It came out right before I graduated college. And my roommate and best friend had it and we would play it and had a great time because we were into survival horror games as most 20 year old white men are. <laughs> uh, so, But it also feels like I played it in high school and I couldn't have because I was not in high school when it came out. But maybe that's just part of the game. The story got rewritten. Who knew? <laughs> Alan Wake got, I got Alan Wake too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here's the thing about the story that Alan Wake is finding pages for. Not only is it going to predict what he does and, like, be about things that he has done, but also the story seems to be rewriting reality to suit its own needs. So, you know, sometimes some of the Taken monsters will just start quoting your own shitty book back at you, the one you don't <laughs> oh, remember <God>. writing. <laughs> yeah. And it it's, look, it's a rough book. <laughs> it's, not a, it's a rough read. <laughs> well, it was... Written over the course of a week in some form of fugue state, so... Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't expect a lot, but the fact that it, like, makes the world different, like, 
is weird and they don't really get a chance to play with that until Alan Wake 2 where they finally have the technology to make it what they want to do work. <laughs> 13 years later. Yes. A brisk 13 years later. <laughs> Like, they tried to do a little bit in some of the DLC for Alan Wake, but that was more like, you point your camera at words, and they make things. Yeah. Right. Like a writer does. Like a writer does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> Can confirm. <laughs> so, like, Alan is going to just muck about in the woods, in and around Bright Falls for, like, a couple of days here, I think. You meet a whole colorful cast of characters. There's Barry, the comic relief, wacky California man who's your best friend and agent. Oh, of course, the agent's f***ing here. Yeah. Yeah, he should, well, because he hasn't heard from Alan in a week, and so he has to come find him. He's also, like, one of the more practical characters in the game. Yeah, like you would think he would be incredibly annoying because he's also here to provide some levity. But no, he's actually like one of the more reasonable people. At a certain point, since darkness is like the problem, like the idea of darkness is attacking people. Capital D darkness. Yeah, he just wraps himself in Christmas lights so they can't get close to him. When you're playing the game, you're like, why can't I do that? <laughs> I would love to have Christmas <laughs> lights on me. That's that's brilliant. <laughs> He's also the only genius who puts on a headlamp, so he has two yeah. hands. <laughs> <laughs> and then Alan, the smart guy writer, is just running through the woods with his pack of Duracell and a handgun without any <laughs> bullets in it. Being like, damn, I wish I had a little bit more room to, to hold something. That'd be so great. <laughs> No way to solve this problem, though. Anyway, I'm going to run into the power plant now. <laughs> you think that he would, like, duct tape his flashlight to the top of the double-barreled shotgun or something? Something. But he refuses. <laughs> he something. Re we also meet Sarah Breaker, who is the practical lady sheriff of town, who is also normal and probably should not be a cop. Yeah. <laughs> it was 2010, folks. <laughs> We hadn't yet hit peak cop video game with Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, there's Dr. Emil Hartman, who will come up later, who is like evil mental health expert who is using artists to power supernatural something. I was about to say, with a name like f***ing Emil in a setting like Bright Falls or whatever, <laughs> I feel like this game maybe is signaling some things with its character names. It's funny you say that because there's definitely a DLC called The Signal. Oh, great. <laughs> Hartman also will have a whole other thing in a different game, too. So mm -hmm. all you Hartman heads out there, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> if you love this man and his gaslighting and a cardigan... <laughs> <laughs> we'll also visit Tor and Odin, the Anderson brothers, who are fun characters. Okay, so the whole thing that we're going on with here is that, okay, so there's an entity called the Dark Presence that I guess Alan just names because he's like that. <laughs> I was about to say, that is a working to ass title. <laughs> that is not. Yeah. It might as well just be called Dark Presence TK, <laughs> just so you know <laughs> to go back and edit it out. Right. <laughs> It's got some real unobtainium vibes to it. Oh my god. I mean, it does. It makes a little bit more sense, Kit, now that you've pointed out he did write the whole book in a few state <laughs> in one week, that this is just draft one, and I've never considered that before. That this whole thing is just the first draft. <laughs> There's just entire sections of the book that say, make this better later. Fix later. <laughs> <laughs> it's not until on Wake 2 that he discovers that he could write other drafts of books. <laughs> he can write more. I would fully believe that all the Alex Casey books have just been written in one go, and that's part of his problem. That's why he got so popular is because everyone's like, it only took one draft and he wrote it. And, and like normal people think that's impressive, but that's not impressive at all. It feels real from the heart. Yeah. And then you're like, that's just actually just that's bad, though. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> it's the reason he can't fucking write is he doesn't know how to make an outline. Yeah. yeah. Look, they're tricky. Actually, honestly... Yeah, considering Alan Wake, yes, yes, Alan Wake 2 would say yes, he does not know how to write an outline. <laughs> Look, second acts are hard. Who even knows how they work? <laughs> it's impossible to figure a second act out. They're fake. And here's the thing, the dark presence, this big amorphous evil blob of chaotic darkness, it's from a location. It's from a place. Can you guess what this place, <laughs> the dark presence is from, it's called? Is it possible it's called the Dark Place? 100%. Dark Place, Dark Place, Dark Place! 
<laughs> Got it in one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So Alice is trapped in the dark place by the dark <laughs> presence, which is currently taking the form of the scary lady from the diner. Did they know about Garth Marenghi's dark place when they made this game? In 2010? Uh, yeah, I think Garth Marenghi's dark place, like, comes after this, right? That was like 20... I think so. 15? I'm doing a Google. Garth Marenghi's dark... I feel like dark place was like... No, that was 2004. 2004. 2004. 2004. Never mind. Okay. Alan Wake fucked love Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. <laughs> There's no other way around it. I'm not sure <laughs> Sam Lake maybe, but Alan Wake, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, if he wrote Night Springs, he would definitely, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Oh God, that's how much of a, like, a 2000s game this feels. <laughs> maybe that's why I feel like it came out way earlier than it did. Because <laughs> I'm confusing <laughs> it with Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which I didn't even watch until like two years ago. Honestly, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place is a piece of media that sort of echoes forward and backward in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always existed in some form or other. Yeah. yeah. And it will be here till long after we're gone. So the Dark Presence, like, the Dark Place uses the creative energy of artists, essentially, in, in any media to try and use that to bring things in these pieces of media to life and change them to suit its own needs is the conceit that we are going with here. Which makes me think that the dark place and the dark presence looked at Alan Wake in his airport cop novels and was like, mm, <laughs> yummy, yummy. <laughs> that is our path to reality. There's <laughs> that is our path to shaping reality is this fucking guy. <laughs> this absolute hack who just writes so, so, so many books. <laughs> and people love them. People eat them up. Yeah, so the Dark Presence from the Dark Place, weighing in at <laughs> infinity pounds, <laughs> is like, I'm going to use this hack writer who has no thoughts in his head, <laughs> and I'm going to use that to like... Get me into the real world, but I did need to take two pit stops first because I tried it two other times with like good artists. Yeah. So maybe if I do it with a bad one, it'll that work. Didn't work out well. Didn't yeah, work yeah, out yeah. well. Back in the seventies, because you know that's when all the creative energy was happening because of all the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when you can still get quaaludes. So yeah. He finds a poet named Thomas Zane who writes beautiful poetry. Tries to use that by like drowning his wife. And then basically manipulating Thomas Zane, the poet, into bringing back his dead wife with darkness poetry magic. You'll never believe it. It didn't go so hot. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine why that didn't work. And like a week after doing that, Thomas Zane is like, ooh, uh-oh, that didn't go so hot. Ah, uh, nuclear option. And creates a piece of poetry that erases himself and his dead wife out of existence. <laughs> it collapses Diver's Isle into the lake because you'll find out later that when you're like, hey, what the hell happened to Diver's Isle? It's gone. Where my wife Alice and I were staying, they were like, well, there, there hasn't, hasn't been, been a Diver's, Diver's Isle in 30 years. <laughs> I don't know if it comes up in this game or if it's in one of the DLCs, but we will find out that Thomas Zane does have superpowers because of his connection to the Dark Place. Um, mm -hmm. And he very possibly invented Alan Wake, the man, in real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because, like, you know the whole story about the light switch, the clicker? Yeah. So there's a poem about that that Thomas Zane wrote. That he hid in a shoebox, which was, don't worry, just go along with it. The shoebox is basically <laughs> this item that, like, contains basically anything that is left of Thomas Zane in reality. Like, it's a safe box. Yeah, it's your Resident Evil inventory box connected through the magic of shoeboxes. He's got a cloud save for it. It's a cloud save shoebox, but it also, it's, it's t the last will and testament of Thomas Zane is the shoebox, <laughs> um, it seems like. So it's got like a page of poetry or prose or something in there that describes this event where Alan's mom gave him the clicker and also contains the clicker in it and says that it used to be connected to a lamp shaped like an angel. <laughs> and maybe Thomas Zane either wrote that event into existence or wrote Alan Wake into existence. Yeah. 
or maybe was his dad? <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that can defeat my otherworldly nemesis, a shit writer. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they tried good shit, like Jake said. Maybe the darkness is like, I'll use this hack writer to come into the world. And Thomas Zane was like, you've fallen right into my trap. That guy sucks so bad at writing. He's never going to write you into reality. You loser. <laughs> and like the other time he tries this was like still in the 70s and like 1976 with the Anderson brothers, Tor and Odin and their band, the oh old my gods God. of Asgard, along with a third guy named Balder. <laughs> Tor Balder and Odin? Now, yeah. Tor and Odin did legally change their names to Tor and Odin, apparently. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if that's still canon. I don't know, because there, there's a whole lot of stuff that moves some things around in Alan Wake 2, so hard to say. Also, Kit, you will be surprised to learn that Odin is missing an eyeball. Mm-hmm. Oh, gee. I'm so shocked to hear that. Yeah. That's not the right and, one. And Tor. <laughs> Tor, he's got a little hammer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for, for fun. <laughs> yeah. In fact, Odin lost his eye in some kind of like darkness event during Deerfest. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also, yeah, Odin lost his eye and Tor got hit by a bolt of lightning. Oh, Jesus. They may or may not have beaten back an army of Taken. It's hard because they are honestly drunk off of the moonshine that they brew themselves using water from Cauldron Lake. <laughs> Which is probably fine for yeah. magic. That's probably okay. What the fuck happened to Balder? Did he get speared to death? We still don't know what happened to Balder, actually. I he definitely got speared to death. Oh, no, wait. Don't we find a thing in Alan Wake 2 that says Balder died from cancer? Oh, well, that's a bummer. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. And that's not in keeping with the theme at all. No, no, it's not. There's some weird vague references to someone named Loki. Don't know if that's just another guy. It could just be, that's just their friend. His name is Luke. He renamed himself Loki. Because <laughs> he he was like, I can't hang out with Tor and Odin and Balder and just be Luke. <laughs> just be Luke. I gotta zhuzh it up a little bit. <laughs> this hasn't quite worked for the Dark Presence. Oh, and also just covering this here real quick. You would think that like 1970s rock might sound different from like 2010s rock. <laughs> a little bit, Yeah. No. You would be wrong. <laughs> you would be wrong. Oh, God. <laughs> Poets of the Fall did not write period music for this. <laughs> Why would you sacrifice that opportunity? So Sam Lake could put his friend's video game music into his video game. <laughs> Even if you as a musician have the opportunity to write like a 70s prog rock album, why would you turn that down? Everyone in the world wants to write a 70s prog rock album deep <laughs> down in their hearts. I think part of it is, and I know you're big fans of Poets of the Fall, so I don't want to, <laughs> I know you're listening, I don't want to disparage you too much. I feel like maybe they probably in 2010 just didn't have it in them to write <laughs> to, no. to do a, some sort of style parody of 70s rock. Like, what's Getty Lee up to in 2010? You can bring him on. <laughs> Couldn't have been that busy. <laughs> or he didn't want to do anything because he was making all that rock band money. Because <laughs> rock band was selling the like hotcakes back then. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Oh, Getty Lee is rolling in 26 cent checks. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the Andersons, this is where we actually get our first musical interlude from these games. Oh, God. It's like the prototype for everything they're going to do later, because it's the sequence where Alan and Barry have to go find a prophetic song at the Anderson farm. And that's also where the Andersons had their like rehearsal space and storage and whatever. And they've got a big stage there. And it's set up to play one of their songs. Complete with pyrotechnics. With lots of pyrotechnics and a ton of ammunition and Duracell batteries. <laughs> oh my God. Duracell brand batteries, our favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Old Gods of Asgard is brought to you by Duracell batteries. We never stop. <laughs> <laughs> and so you basically just hit a button and it starts blasting their music <laughs> while you do a big like wave defense yeah. that lasts the entirety of the song. But the thing is that because you've got so much ammo and there's so much like automated shit of just like setting Taken on fire, it's actually just like kind of a fun interlude. It's the first time in the game where you can like adequately take out monsters without like worrying about how many batteries you have or how many bullets you have. So it's like kind of the first time combat is actually fun in the game. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it only lasts for about three and a half minutes. It is not a fair. It is not a very. The combat in that game is not very good. No. But it is right there. 
where it's fun. Yeah. One could make the argument that it's not supposed to be fun, but it should still, like, if you're gonna have it, it should be something. If these guys are going to keep respawning if I stand idle in the woods looking for a coffee thermos, then they should make the video game combat a bit more enjoyable than, rah, jump scare! Yeah. Here's your book! I feel like the survival horror aspect of the combat is, like, probably what they were more leaning towards. But, yeah, like Annie said, if you are (laughs) idle for too long in, uh, like, three steps off the path of where you should be, they will respawn and you will be attacked by more guys. And you only have four bullets and one Duracell battery left. And Alan can only run for 15 feet at a time. (laughs) So, like, it's not... (laughs) Super good playtime. They were probably going for tension, but it's not tension or dread. It's more just annoyance. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, Alan wanders in the woods for like 10 to 20 hours. (laughs) Yeah. At one point gets himself kidnapped like twice, actually. There's an FBI agent who wants to kill him who gets et by the dark place because most people get et by the dark place. (laughs) Is there a reason the FBI agent wants to kill him or is he just there? Oh, he found pages from the book that talk about him in a disparaging way. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah. And so he's like, well, better kill him. And it's also probably like in the book is like, and then the FBI agent tried to kill Alan Wake. And he's like, I got him now. So, <laughs> Well, pages said so. <laughs> what are you going to do? If only I had the page where he kills me instead. <laughs> <laughs> Half the town gets ed up by Dark Place or something. Some of them come back. Some of them don't, I think. You end up going out to, like, find the lamp lady and the power station because she's the only reasonable one who's like, maybe I should carry around a flashlight. <laughs> maybe stockpile some batteries. She's also the only person who remembers Thomas Zane currently because, like... Yeah. He left her as, like, the guardian of the planet the Earth shoebox. against the dark place. Yeah, of the shoebox against the dark place. And, like, everyone's like, oh, it's the weird lamp lady. And it's, like, the problem is that, like, she hasn't really talked to people in, like, th- at this point, 40 years because she's been making sure the power station stays on so that, like, the dark place doesn't get out. That's very cool, but I feel very bad for her <laughs> that she is put in this position. The rest of the town considers her just this weird public nuisance because she just keeps bothering the police station about keeping the light bulbs changed. Yeah, but that's very important because everyone gets that up by the dark place <laughs> without the good light bulbs in. <laughs> She was also in love with Thomas Zane or something, and she leaves a whole bunch of messages around town in, like, things that only show up under flashlights, like, just all these weird little messages about, like, here, I got you this stockpile resource, you're gonna need more batteries, here's some ammunition, also, Thomas, you left me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because Thomas was not married to her, and, mm, Nope. Interesting, mm -hmm. mm mm-mm, mm-mm. But Alan Wake eventually does get a hold of the clicker. And he can't just, like, flick it to turn things off. He has to use it to rewrite the ending. Is he doing that in this one? I don't think so. I feel like yes, but I also have no clue how using the clicker, (laughs) to be completely honest with you. I remember that what happens at the end of the video game is that you finally make your way back to Diver's Isle and Barbara Jagger, the scary old lady, is there who is also the dark presence. And there's a big darkness tornado and it's an action video game. So you have to, you know, fight guys and birds. Yeah. Because she also took over birds. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And then you just sort of, like, walk up to her, shove the clicker into her chest, and then flick the switch, and that makes the darkness go away. Yeah, it also has the side effect of trapping you, Alan Wake, in the dark place for the next mm, 13 years. Yeah. (laughs) 13 years or thereabouts. (laughs) It will turn out. I feel like the whole point of the clicker is obviously, like, to turn the light on and to, like, you know, shut off the darkness, but, like... Right, Spider-Man, turn off the darkness. Right, yeah, but there's... (laughs) There's also, like, a thing about Thomas Zane in the diver suit and, like, that, like, I don't know if it protects him or is the one who drags him down. There is also a, this is important, Thomas Zane looks just like Alan Wake. That'll come up. Or it already came up. That's a, it, Or does he? He does, but he doesn't. Because, again, he might be his dad. He might have created him out of thin air. It's hard to tell. There's also <laughs> a doppelganger of 
Alan Wake named Mr. Scratch. Very subtle. Who is played by Ilka Vili. I love how it's subtle. And then in Alan Wake 2, they're like, that's the nickname for the devil. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay. You're just going to say it now, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for clarifying that, yeah, bud. Yeah, we hadn't caught on over the last 13 years. <laughs> yeah, it's like in the last like 10 seconds of the video game or maybe in the last 10 seconds of one of the DLCs where it's just like, hey, who the f*** is this? This is a second Alan Wake. And Thomas Zane is like, his name is Mr. Scratch. Don't worry about it. <laughs> dum, dum. And then the game ends. And then I think in Alan Wake's American Nightmare, which is like a side game, you're in an episode of Night Springs and you're just basically like <laughs> doing the same thing over and over again. But you're trying to not get like let Mr. Scratch out, who might be the Dark Presence version of you. It's hard to again, it's very unclear at the time. The whole point of American Nightmare is that you're like you're doing these things like over and over again. And at the end, it's like, well, it didn't work. And it's like, well, why did I play the whole game? Then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because like the whole DLC for Alan Wake that comes out after because Alan is now trapped in the dark place and is going to try to write a new novel to free himself using the power of the dark place and whatever in his little writer's room with his little typewriter. Should go perfectly fine. Yeah. I don't see any problems happening because of that. And the DLC is immediately, oh, it doesn't work very well. I'm just going mad and I'm trapped in my own story. Whoops. Because you just cannot be cool for five seconds. <laughs> A lot of his problems could be solved if he could just be cool for like five seconds. Five seconds. Oh, my God. The whole DLC is like you're trapped in a story and you see little videos of yourself going mad on the outside in the dark place. And like Thomas Zane, the diver, keeps showing up and he's like, hey, you keep sinking and going deeper. You should try to go up. And then he does that like five times throughout these two DLCs where he's like, dude, you keep going down up. <laughs> Stop it. You go up. And Alan's like, no, I'm pretty sure if I go down far enough, I'll be back up. And then <laughs> he is in an episode of the TV show that's not the Twilight Zone. You'd play that for several hours. And then at the end, it's like, and then you got out. And then it pulls out and you're just watching that on TV. And it's like, psych, you didn't get out. You are still trapped in the dark place. It's a way to go, Alan Way. <laughs> Did the wife at least get yes. rescued? Yes. Alice does get okay. out. You do have confirmation at the end of the video game that at least Alice, in her underwear, in just a Still tank top undies. and her underwear, <laughs> is on the shores of Cauldron Lake and is like, what the hell just happened? And also Barry's there. Yeah. And Sarah Breaker. Sarah Breaker, the cop who shouldn't be a cop. Right. But this time at least... People didn't forget Alan Wake existed, like what happened with Thomas Zane. So I guess that's progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Alan Wake video games are very much like, hey, so it's slightly less bad, right? That's that's a win. Huh? That's a win. We accomplished the thing we set out to do at the inciting incident of the story. There is a whole plot point in Alan Wake 2 that I don't know if it was like a response to the way Alan Wake 1 ended or like just always the plan because it could go either way but there is a point where it's made explicit that like this is a horror story so like the good guys will ultimately lose in a way and like it feels like that them being like so remember how in Alan Wake 1 it didn't really end good and then you had to wait 13 years for this one that was on purpose <laughs> because of stories you see so think about that <laughs> And they're like, so maybe don't get your hopes up about the end of this video yeah. <laughs> game. So, so when it happens again, don't be surprised. <laughs> okay, so that's Alan Wake. After that, they make Alan Wake's American Nightmare like two years later, mostly reusing assets and whatever. Then they have a video game called Quantum Break, which is not part of the Remedy Connected universe. For now, maybe? That so, may change, I take it? It was like commissioned by Microsoft for them to make a game. That would also be a TV show. So you would play a chapter of the game and then you would watch an episode of the TV show and then you would play a chat, et cetera, et cetera, as part of this new like. Is that what the hook was? That's what the hook was. OK, now I'm not remembering there ever being a TV <laughs> show <laughs> called Quantum Break. Well, it was supposed to be like sort of the like. I guess, proof of concept for, like, Microsoft TV or whatever. Like, it was, like, through Xbox One. God, right, because they were trying to make, like, a Halo TV show, too. They were trying to make that a thing. Yeah, they wanted there to be, like, this integration between TV and video games that you could only play on the Microsoft Xbox One. <laughs> and 
Unfortunately, that sounds like a 2012 era Microsoft uh, plan. Yeah. And unfortunately, it didn't work very well because it was prohibitively expensive because they had to make an episode of television for every chapter of the video game that you played when it came out i don't know if it came out like on a like weekly or how it worked exactly i don't really remember but it like it just none of it was very well thought out also the problem is that quantum break not the best remedy game (laughs) so nobody wanted to play more of it and so then remedy didn't make any more games for microsoft and now you can't watch the tv show anywhere i mean you can like you can find files of it on you know various and sundry parts of the internet but like you can't go to microsoft and just like click on let me watch quantum break again (laughs) you can play it on game pass right now though i think so there's that at least but that's like half the story it's half the story but it's also like not a good half of the story because like not a ton happens in the episodes from what i remember (laughs) because it's just like getting you to the next part of the video game using some of the characters but like it's also not very well written Mm. It's not a good show, so like you wouldn't want to watch it, so you didn't want to play more of the game. So the whole kind of thing just kind of crumbled in on itself. The main important part of Quantum Break that you need to know is that the main character, played by Sean Ashmore, name is like Jack Joyce or something like that. <laughs> he will appear later in Alan Wake 2 as, as a similar character, but different. He gets time powers from the quantum break happening and then there's like they keep seeing the end of time and he needs to solve that and then his friend played by Littlefinger from Game of Thrones turns out to be the bad guy because obviously that guy is going to be the bad guy in a thing (laughs) look at his face (laughs) that's his whole casting that's the whole point of him yeah and then there's also a character named Mr. Hatch it's like Marvin Hatch or something like that played by Lance Reddick Mr. Hatch Yep, hold, yep, yep, I, you, you, did you, did you put it together? Did you see, did you see? Played by Lance Reddick, okay. Played by Lance Reddick. Okay. He's like, uh, some sort of otherworldly entity. Okay. And then unfortunately, Lance Reddick did pass away, but maybe in Alan Way 2, there's a character that was supposed to be yeah. the same character played by Lance Reddick. Called uh, Mr. Door. Mr. Door, Yeah. <laughs> Who is also like very, like very tellingly in this game full of fins, the only black guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's also like the guy they got to play Mr. Door is good. But if that would have been Lance Reddick, oh, that would have been really good. <laughs> I would have really liked that. That makes a lot of sense that that was a Lance Reddick role. Yeah. And then I think it also would have added a lot more gravitas to it because, you know, Lance Reddick is just like such a good actor that like whenever he's doing anything, any dumb thing, he, like I don't know if either of you saw the Resident you Evil. You take it more seriously. Yeah. Have you seen the Resident Evil TV show that he pl- where he plays Wesker? No. It's. I think it's good. I think it's a good time, a good fun time. But if that would have been anybody else but Lance Reddick, it would have probably been as stupid as a lot of people think it is. Because <laughs> it is stupid. Because it's Resident Evil, and all Resident Evil is stupid. But everyone thinks it's cool, but it's never been cool. It's always been like a cheesy, stupid thing. Mm-hmm. And then they just get mad when it's not a cool thing, because it's never been a cool thing. But I digress about Resident <laughs> Evil. Anyway, he was good in it. It's a, it's a fun <laughs> show. Justice for Burt. Bert's the best. I also did find out while trying to look this up that Quantum Break was basically just based on a collection of ideas they had for an Alan Wake sequel because they were really just trying to make an Alan Wake sequel. And they were like, oh, OK, <laughs> <laughs> well, here's some shit that we have. Let's make an AU. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that makes a kind of sense. It is more like sci fi than dark horror fantasy kind of than Alan Mm -hmm. Wake is but like in a way that I can definitely see the strings of like oh yeah you wanted Alan Wake to have time powers in the next one that makes sense yeah okay 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 so then they made a better video game yeah (laughs) a way better one then in 2019 they released Control this was my introduction to Remedy I went back and played Alan Wake before Alan Wake 2 came out but I love Control same it's my favorite and I've been a Remedy fan since before I knew the Remedy made Max Payne, because I like the Max Payne games, even though they are, I don't know, they're not great. I just like them. So this is a game that centers around the Federal Bureau of Control, which is a U.S. government institution that's like Men in Black and SCP Foundation, these sorts of like, there is, you know, things to go bump in the night, we're the ones that bump back, etc. Yeah. Okay, so here's how the FBC works. It is in a building called the Oldest House. 
it calls itself the oldest house. That is just what it is called. It's not really what people outside the FBC call it. It just looks like a big, brutalist hellscape building with no windows in the middle of New York. (laughs) (laughs) That you usually can't see if you're a regular person. Yeah, your eye just slides right past it. Yeah. The whole building has, like, older stuff in it, like, tech built past, like, the 1950s and 60s just doesn't seem to work, and also cell phones are very dangerous because they have the internet on them, and you don't want to bring the internet into the Federal Bureau of Control. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think the most, like, the newest technology that you see in the oldest house that is actively being used is a copy machine, but it's a big one. And it's also part of a nightmare. So maybe it's not actually there now that I'm thinking about it. That's true. They also use pneumatic tubes. Love it. Which more buildings should. I was hooked from the start. You put a pneumatic tube in something, I'm in. I'm sold. I love a pneumatic tube. Oh, everything should have more pneumatic tubes. We just, I want a tube that goes thunk. <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think this is an unreasonable expectation we need to have. <laughs> it's not. And it, we should all have them. We need to return. We need, specifically, we need to return to (laughs) pneumatic tubes. We have to go back. (laughs) The FBC has lots of different departments that cover different things like research and development, statistics and probability, the Black Rock Quarry. Maintenance. Yeah, and maintenance. Everyone's favorite, maintenance. Maintenance. There's a whole quarry in it. You can, like, go into a quarry that they get the Black... Why is there a quarry? (laughs) Well, because you got to well, get the black, rocks, the black from somewhere. rocks Yeah. And you can only get it from the quarry. Is it just the, the quarry's just under the building? Well, it's sort of. Well, it might be on another planet. It's hard to pin down where it is. <laughs> you can go there, but I don't know where it is. So. And sometimes it moves where it is. Yeah. That's the other thing about the oldest house is that it's constantly shifting. It's a bit of a house of leaves. Yeah. It's very much a house of leaves situation. And sometimes you'll like, you'll go into a, an area and then you will try to leave that area. And the area is in a new area and you don't know where it is. So now you're just trapped in a closet somewhere (laughs) that's full of clocks. You're just in the mail room now. You're just in the mail room. You now live in the mail room. Congratulations. I hope you brought some snacks. There's a whole department of people who just try to go map the oldest house and find people that got lost when the house shifted. And it is a giant office building. This feels like the ideal like setting for like an extremely dry workplace comedy, but I get the feeling that's not the tone here. No, no, I would say, yeah, that, yeah. It kind of is. They kind of like hit that. I mean, you're also like fighting monsters and stuff and doing weird things with like, here's a rubber duck that keeps following you around. You just need to trick it back into its like cage. Cause, it's like, holding cell. You don't want the rubber duck following you around for too long for whatever reason. But there is a lot of, I would say a a good, like, 40% of the game's lore is in files that you find, and they are, like, redacted, and they're all, like, very, like, a lot of them are, like, very dry of just, like, there's a refrigerator that you have to look at, and if you don't look at it, it'll get you, and so (laughs) someone always has to be looking at the refrigerator, but, like, the report on that is just, like, at 2 p.m. shift change between Derek and Jeff, and Jeff has to watch the refrigerator for the next six hours now. You can find, like, records of a book club that is partially redacted. Yeah, the redactions are always very funny, because you, you never know what could be under there, but a lot of times it feels like it's just, like, we had to redact something, so we redacted this part. You also have to, like, find parts of the oldest house that you can, like, lock in place for a while by basically following ley lines. And sometimes the house, if the house feels like it's under attack, because like the whole thing is that it's under attack. So some parts will be like even more brutalist than normal because they are in a lockdown mode where just like all the walls shrunk in. And it's a weird <laughs> sort of jagged pattern. And then you just have to undo that by killing ghosts. And again, it is mostly an office building. But then like you do that and there is like a janitor's closet <laughs> right there or like a copy machine that now is usable again. It's a very, very weird place. The thing is that people, the FBC was a pre-existing organization and then they kind of found the oldest house. And it's unclear if they understand it. They don't really understand it. They don't really get it. And also, like, they are part of the government because from before because they found the oldest house. But, like, now they also work for not the government, too, (laughs) in a weird way. They work for the board. Which, Kit, could you guess what the board is? What do you think the board would be in this situation? Uh, Like a board of directors type situation? That's right. It is an upside down black pyramid. Correct. (laughs) It's what? (laughs) That is located in the astral plane. 
It's in the what? Apple Play. It's an upside down black pyramid that talks to you. Okay. And can only communicate with the director of the Federal Bureau of Control via a red telephone that has no numbers on it. Yeah. And the way you become the director is, that's right, the gun chooses you. <laughs> Yeah, the the shape changing <laughs> service weapon, an object of power. <laughs> and if you can touch it, congratulations, you're now in charge of a branch of the government. <laughs> but that, that depends on whether or not the board <laughs> likes you. The upside down black pyramid likes you, yeah, whether it likes you. The upside right. down black pyramid from the astral plane that speaks in <laughs> yep. muffled nonsense and seems to be partially translated, but not very well. My favorite part is like sometimes they'll be like most of a sentence and then it'll give you like a part of a sentence and it'll give you like four different options. Like it'll be like, congratulations, director slash prisoner slash servant. Main character. Slash main character. And it's like, I guess we're supposed to pick which one we think would go here because it could be any in their language. It could be any of these. It's very much a localization thing. Like it could mean any of these in context. <laughs> yeah. If only I knew Finnish, then I could probably tell what it was. <laughs> So the conceit here is that this is where they basically go out and explore supernatural things that are happening because they're like, Alan Wake is a normal thing that happens. It's just, it's a particular flavor of things. It's not all darkness based, but you know, sometimes you just have altered world events, AWEs, which doesn't stand for Alan Wake event. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't it be funny if it did? <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if it did? Put a pin in that one. <laughs> Keep that in your pocket. And they're just like, yeah, so, you know, we just go out and we just, you know, stop these sorts of things, catalog them, track them. We bring back things that seem to be affected by the astral plane and are haunted. Objects of power can give you superpowers if you bond with them, like the service weapon, the shape-shifting gun that makes you in charge of the government. <laughs> so what I'm getting here is that these guys massively dropped the ball on the whole Bright Falls situation. You very much so, and you will yeah. find uh, lots of documents that point right towards that. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, no, Bright Falls is a big oopsies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsies, fumbled that one. <laughs> I knew that Remedy made the games, but there is a point when you're playing the games where, like, you find a document that talks about Alan Wake, the video game, but, like, some of it's redacted and it says Bright Falls. And I was like, wait a minute, like, the same Bright Falls? And they're like, yeah, that one. <laughs> we were off the mark on that one. And anyway, now we have a station out there. That was a fucky wucky. <laughs> yeah. And now we have a station out there just in case it happens again. Because <laughs> if it happens twice, that's on us at this point. <laughs> yeah, at that point, we're really fucking up. Because <laughs> like, you'll find out later that it turns out Sarah Breaker, the sheriff who shouldn't be a cop, her dad is actually a retired FBC agent who is probably sending reports back to the oldest house like, hey, guys, guys, <laughs> can someone come here, please? Guys, <laughs> can I just give me five minutes, a five minute phone call with somebody, please? There's like, yeah, they have objects of power, altered items, which are just like regular paranatural things like rubber duckies that follow you around or a refrigerator you have to look at. A merry-go-round horse. There's a merry-go-round horse. There's a whole wing of it. It's called the Panopticon. There's a whole wing that's just a bunch of, like, weird objects in rooms so they don't get weird. One of them's, like, an old, like, 1960s, like, Christmas tree, like the tin, shiny Christmas trees. And they're like, this one's rough. Don't... There's, like, a paper lantern. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. It's just always, like, a little note about it. Like, this thing did a weird thing, and now we have to keep it in jail. <laughs> Yeah, Whoops. it's it's haunted object <laughs> jail. Yeah. <laughs> they also keep track of para-utilitarians, which is basically magic users. You do weird magic <laughs> shit. We don't like it. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> the oldest house also crosses over frequently with a location that is simply called the Ocean View Motel. Great. <laughs> Sometimes a light switch just appears in hallways. Like a pull-down light switch. Yeah. Like the rope one, yeah. And, you know, just a click-click. The thing is that, like, you know how there's always just little rituals that you do, like, you know, you got to pull the light switch three times to make it go, or you got to turn the USB upside down a couple of times. They're just like, okay, so there's just, like, rituals that make things work. We don't understand why maybe the object's like that, but just, this is just what works. Just do it. Someone figured out. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. Just do it. Somebody <laughs> figured out that this is how you make this thing do its job. 
So you just got to do that. And don't worry about it. Like how you have to just watch the refrigerator. Sometimes you have to just watch the refrigerator. And if you don't, it'll get you. <laughs> we lost like five guys to the refrigerator. <laughs> yes. Before we figured out you got to watch the yeah. refrigerator. Literally, yes. I think it was five. You eventually do have to fight the refrigerator. And you get there, unfortunately, late. And someone has just got gotten by the refrigerator. <laughs> He's just gone. <laughs> Yeah, a poor guy. You break eye contact for a second to go into another room, and he's just gone. <laughs> and they're just like, oh, man, not Phil. Oh. Ah, beans. We lost Phil the refrigerator again. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, you should probably kill the refrigerator. <laughs> and you're like, all right, let me give it a shot. Yeah, we haven't taken care of it up to this point, because up till now, this let a guy sit there and watch it plan was working just fine. It was. It's been working so well so far. <laughs> Didn't feel the need to escalate. <laughs> <laughs> the Ocean View Motel also lets you, like, traverse places. Nobody's ever figured out where the Ocean View Motel is. Sometimes people knock from the outside, but the doors don't open. It seems like maybe it's in, like, the middle of landlocked New Mexico or something. Why is it called the Ocean View? <laughs> That's just what it's called, baby. <laughs> oh, God. That's just on the desk. The desk just says Ocean View, so we got no other name for it. Sometimes you have to solve puzzles. Puzzles that are like, there's three rooms on one side. There's actually, there's six rooms on one side and six rooms on the other side. And on the one side, they're like normal rooms. Three of them are just like, go in these rooms and like do stuff. And then that'll let you move on and get past wherever. And then the other side of the rooms is like, this is the one that lets you get out usually this is the one marked with an upside down triangle so that's the one that you want and then one of them is a spiral there's a bunch of other shapes you can't go in those rooms they're too spooky we can't let you in those <laughs> rooms just yet those are the scary rooms yeah you don't want to be in there do you i think you do go in the spiral room there's also a janitor's closet obviously gotta have a janitor's closet there's also sometimes you can hear people outside the hotel. If you go to the door, you can like hear people. So I think that it's in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire, but I, <laughs> I have no justification for that. They've tried mapping it. They've tried recording things or like sliding cameras underneath the doors. It doesn't work. Nope. Speaking of janitors, though, there's also someone else in the Federal Bureau of Control or to be more specific, someone in the oldest house. His name is Ati. And he's the best. He's the actual best. He is Ati the janitor. He's an old Finnish guy. He is deeply Finnish. He is Finland the man. <laughs> and <laughs> so the game starts with you going into the oldest house when it's on lockdown, which like shouldn't have been able to happen because it's on lockdown. But you're very special. So don't just, you know, don't worry about that. And the first thing you do is because the main character is looking for a brother. First thing you do is run into Ati. And he goes, oh, you're my new janitor's assistant. And you're like, no. And he's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then he puts you to work. And now you're a janitor's assistant for the rest of the game. He just, he just thinks that's what you do. <laughs> yeah. Even when you're the <laughs> boss of the entire, like, organization, you're also the janitor's assistant. Yeah. <laughs> you do some chores for him. And the thing is that Jesse is like, sure. Yeah, okay. I've worked a bunch of odd jobs. I've been a janitor before. Yeah. Ati probably knows what's going on. And yes, Ati does know what's going on. There's a point in the DLC where they're like, we don't know who Ati is. We don't know how we got here. <laughs> First of all, don't take a video of him. That never goes good. No. <laughs> also, just let him keep doing whatever he's doing. Because we don't know what happens yeah. if he doesn't do it. <laughs> Ati just showed up. They tried to, like, just do experiments to figure out what the hell he is. It never worked. And Ati just showed up and he was like, I'm the janitor. <laughs> Hi, I work here. I'm the janitor. <laughs> and bad things happen if Ati doesn't do what he says he's going to do. Not that, like, Ati makes them happen, but just, like... They're just like, just just let him do whatever the hell he says he does. Whatever it is, it's working. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Ati is benign, but... Mm. But weird. Also, Ati is the Finnish name of a water god. Probably unrelated. Interesting. <laughs> Probably unrelated. <laughs> Probably not a, anything to do with that, but interesting factoid. Yep. Mm -hmm. So he's the janitor. It's fine. He's it's the, Ati. He's the greatest. He's your friend. He's the best. It's just some shitty old Finn. <laughs> <laughs> and like a pair of coveralls with a mop he's just got his blue outfit on with his little name tag and he's just mopping somewhere and every once in a while he'll be like hey there's a problem in the vent and you gotta go do that my janitor's assistant <laughs> and you're like but i'm the boss now and he's like not to me you're not get in the vent <laughs> Get the f vent. And like Ati also speaks in like literally translated Finnish idioms <laughs> yeah, I don't remember any offhand, but they are very funny. Like, they don't hire you. 
Peter, you are no hell of it. There be work for the axe. Take them behind the sauna, you hollowed. Ati the janitor is a friendly face in my book. And you're just like, you know what? Yeah, you probably know what's going on. It's cool, Ati. I love Ati so much. So yeah, Jesse Faden, the actual main character. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse's looking for her brother, Dylan. They lived in a town called Ordinary, Maine, where 17 years ago, they discovered an object of power, they think, called the Slide Projector. And you basically- needed to tell me that the place called Ordinary, Maine turned out to not be completely normal. <laughs> You'll never believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Seems improbable. <laughs> and yet. And yet. So, like, they find this thing called the slide projector that allows them to travel to worlds connected to a handful of special slides they find with the projector in, like, the junkyard or something. Yeah. And so some, you know, Stephen King children have supernatural adventures. Shit happens. Yeah. You put in a slide. It takes you to a place. You go hang out in there. Sometimes it's chill. Sometimes there's something called the not mother that wants to transform you into her children. Yeah. Ah, okay. (laughs) You know, you can go to the meadow. You can go to the temple, meet the not mother. (laughs) It's fine. There's the place with the big pillars. That's always nice to look at. Don't go to the one with the not mother. Yeah, I love them. (laughs) And her dung apes. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes your friend gets turned into something that's not a dog. It's not a dog. (laughs) And it's, look, we don't know what it is, but it's not a dog. I can tell you that for free. (laughs) Also, sometimes bullies get mad that you got a cool other world protection machine. And so they like beat you up and take it and they go hang out with the not mother. And then they turn into something that is dung apes. And it it gets really bad from there. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes on the bright side, you meet an extra dimensional entity that is your friend and you just kind of call it Polaris because it's like your guiding star. And she protects you from the weird stuff like the Knot Mother. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The cool thing about Polaris is that you don't know that that's what's going on when you start. And so there is a point really early in the game where Jesse like looks at you and like looks at the camera and she's talking to Polaris. But it's like she's just looking to you. And I was like, oh, I'm in this game now. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Cool. <laughs> yeah, for a while before she explains it, Jesse just has like an inner monologue conversation with a silent entity called Polaris that's only represented by like a visual fractal pattern. Yeah, and some like twinkling sounds. So you don't really know what's going on either, but you're in the video game now. You and your friend Jesse. Yeah, I'm helping my friend Jesse kill ghosts and stuff <laughs> now. The FBC eventually arrives, does another fucky wucky on Ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie. What th- I'm guessing the track record of this organization is not great. They're great at <laughs> containing things, but like stopping things yeah. before they happen is not their forte. They are not a proactive group. It's a good thing that <laughs> no. they don't have to pay rent on the building that they work out of or else they would be <laughs> out on their asses <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Like, eventually they show up in Ordinary. After Jesse and Dylan, with Polaris's help, managed to turn off the slide projector. And this is after all of the adults in town have disappeared, by the way. Yeah. Oh, great. Because I th- I think one of the slides is like a wish place. And they're like, oh, if only the adults were here. <laughs> and then they weren't anymore. Yeah. But then the not mother can come out and take control of all the other children. And the only thing that stops you from getting taken over is number one, Polaris. And number two, your friend who's not a dog kills the lead bully who is now a dung ape monster under control of the not mother. And then the government finally shows up. I should note that none of these are things that you see or like learn that much about over the course of the story. They're just things you find in like, this is just backstory. Yeah. 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 These are files that you find about the incident. <laughs> that are like, like interviews. Yeah. So that's just another random shit that happened in the background, you know, in the same way that like one of the previous directors of the Federal Bureau of Control definitely got corrupted by the service weapon or maybe the board and seemed to have gotten extremely irradiated and now just lives in the in the uh, in the generator. He just. Yeah. <laughs> he just lives He's there. He's what keeps the lights on now. Yeah. He's asleep. You never really meet him or even find out any direct confirmation about this, but hmm, don't wake up the generator. Yeah, so there's a, in maintenance, the whole maintenance area, there's a thing called like the Northmore generator or something. Yeah. And then much later on, you learn that that's a guy. Northmore is a guy. And he's just in there because it got weird. And this was the best way to solve that problem is to make him 
And it's nothing that you ever directly interact yeah. with. I feel like a lot about the FPC is just, it got weird and this was the best solution we had to the problem. <laughs> just, that's yep. pretty much how they operate. That's just the whole organization. Yeah. You know that meme of someone very like enthusiastically slapping some duct tape on a gigantic <laughs> crack in a water basin? That's the FPC. Yeah. <laughs> They're not actually very good at their jobs, but they're the only ones doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect way to put it. I feel like that should be on their little crest. Is We're not great at this, but it's only us out here. So, <laughs> FBC, we're all you have. Do you want to try? <laughs> Do you want to give it a go? Speaking of which, actually, because of that, like, previous director problem, the current director was like, hey, so we should probably have some kind of Linux succession lined up. Let's kidnap this boy from Ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Zachary Trench. He is played by the guy who voiced Max Payne. Yep. Okay. Because they know him and they like him. He's a friend from work. He also recently passed away. R.I.P. in peace. He did pass away recently. It was very sweet seeing all of the like decades of photos and stuff of them with him as like, you know, while they're paying tribute. That was very sweet. The character, Trench, he's the current director and he was the first guy to be like, yes, we should have a live session, but also like maybe there should be some rules around here. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't just be able to check out of the library a floppy disk that gives you telekinesis. <laughs> maybe we should have rules about that. Maybe we should introduce a bit of bureaucracy. And then over the course of his tenure, it was like, what about a lot of bureaucracy? <laughs> I have a theory about that. I don't know if it's ever actually stated in there, but I have a theory that all the bureaucracy is to keep the weird stuff tricked. Like they're too confused because there's so many new things that they have like outlines and, and ways of doing things. Oh, yeah. And like rules and stuff. Yeah. It's just a lot of it is just to keep things from not getting out of control because they don't know how to best to get out of control anymore. Well, you know, paranatural entities are like children. They crave structure. They do crave structure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they kidnapped Jesse's little brother. And Jessie escaped. They wanted her to. And then she spent the next 17 years running from town to town, taking odd jobs, trying to find her brother. And then like right before the video game starts, Jessie's little fragment of Polaris that lives in her head has woken up and it's like, hey, we should go to the FBC that, you know, no reason. Um, <laughs> right now is a great time to do that, though. I don't know why. It just seems really, it just seems really good. Like, we should go do that now. And when you get there, it's on lockdown because they're under attack by a malevolent entity called the Hiss. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. The Hiss is red ghosts that take over your friends, the people who work there, and turn them into monsters with various powers. You know, video game guys. Yeah, and also the only thing that can repel them, aside from Polaris, which seems, she seems great at it for... I'm sure an unconnected reason is a little <laughs> cool vest you can put on that will keep you protected from them. It's like a life jacket called a Hedron Resonance Amplifier or HRA. They were handed out throughout the department without explanation by research and development like a couple of days before the hiss started attacking. <laughs> Uh, Don't ask why we have these. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And, you know, in a post-pandemic era, that hits different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, a whole bunch of people were like, I don't need this. And then they got hissed. And now they're ghosts. Now they're red ghosts. Now you're red ghosts. And this one can go invisible. <laughs> and it's kind of like a pterodactyl, I think. <laughs> oh, man. Also. Uh, beans. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's in a chair and it's just flying. The flying chair guys suck. I hate the flying <laughs> chair guys. Flying chair guys. They're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> also, management crisis, the head of research and development that handed out these HRAs has disappeared. His name is Dr. Casper <laughs> Darling. And also, Zachariah Trench just shot himself in the head with a service weapon. And Jesse picked up the gun, so I guess she's in charge now. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> The way it like the information is disseminated is like you find the office. He's dead. You're like, whoa, he shot himself with this weird gun. And then you that's how you play the video game is by shooting things with that gun. And you're fine with that. And then like a little bit later, they're like, oh, you got the gun. Oh, well, you're in charge now. And you're like, hold on. What? <laughs> I don't even <laughs> yeah, work here. Everybody's like, like, oh, OK, you got the gun. You're the boss now. This is yeah. a natural form of succession. This is normal. And then once you find that out, all the pictures of Trench of like the director pictures that are on the walls and stuff all change to you because you're in charge now. Immediately. You did not take that photo. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you run the place now. 
And you're like, I am literally just some lady. I need you to know that about me. <laughs> you also receive visions of the previous director. Just, you know, sometimes little full motion video visions of the past. Like you do. Don't know where that's coming from. The hotline, maybe? The red phone that the board contacts you on? It's probably fine. Yeah. It's totally normal. And also the first time that like it is a silhouette of a real human man, it just pops up on the video game. I was afraid because I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I'm not used to seeing real people in video games. It's like a broken TV jump scare. Yeah. It's just like, whoa, okay. And he's just like there smoking a cigarette. Like, here's what you have to do so that you don't shoot yourself with this magic weapon. <laughs> And I was like, well, hold on, guy. I don't even work here yet. I at best I'm a janitor's assistant. You need to calm down. And again, it's like Max Payne also voices this character. So yeah. now you have just like this grim, grizzled guy with like cigarette throat. Yeah. Just being like, we put Northmore in a tank. <laughs> he got out of control. So we put him in the tank. Watch out for that. <laughs> But don't. It's not in this video game. Uh, yeah. At some point, he's like, you got to go get the phone. And you're like, why? And he's like, you just got to get the goddamn phone. Don't ask questions. And you're like, okay. And then the board can talk to you now because you have the phone. It's like, okay, weird. Yeah. And the board sends you fun little messages. I appreciate the intellectual honesty of a video game going, just fucking do it. <laughs> don't ask questions. Just fucking do it. It's really nice in some ways because like in a lot of games, you're like, why am I doing this? Why does this thing happen? Like if you play like, for example, my favorite $15 word is ludonarrative dissonance, right? <laughs> it's just a goofy word, but it's like you're playing Bioshock Infinite and the whole thing is about like choices and peace and like doing what you're supposed to do versus what you're expected to do. And the whole time you're just killing a million people. Like, you just kill every single person you ever see in the game. And you're like, why am I doing any of this? This doesn't fit the story at all. And then you get to control, and they're like, you have no clue what's going on. Like, just do the goddamn video game, all right? You'll yeah, get there eventually. It's like, we don't know why it works this way. Just do it. Just play the goddamn video game and stop asking questions, for Christ's sake. And you're like, all right, you got me. They'll give you five seconds to be like, can Jesse uncorrupt a his person? No. Great. No qualms. Go. <laughs> yeah. There's one point because you finally get to like the executive branch and you meet some people who are like hold up there and then they're like, well, can you try to fix her? Because you seem to be able to get rid of some of his stuff. And you try to fix someone and she dies and they're like, OK, don't do that again. And you're like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so much for that plan. Good to know. Because like there's people who are like not actually totally corrupted by the hiss, but they're partially corrupted by the hiss, just floating around on the ceiling and they're all just reciting a poem. Yep, that's probably normal. The his incantation. Yeah. That's normal. <laughs> it's a weird Dadaist poem. <laughs> it doesn't actually make any sense. Even in the context of control, it doesn't like tell you anything that's going to happen. It's just weird. And they're like, okay, so maybe don't try to uncorrupt them. Maybe let's just see if they just come back down later. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just wait to see how this plays out. Yeah, maybe they'll just stop. The other ones, though, just go ahead and shoot those ones. If they're trying to get yeah. you, just go ahead and shoot them. Once you get telekinesis, you can throw literally anything in the game at them. Just don't worry oh about those God. ones, though. They're gone. The floating ones, maybe we'll get them back. But, you know, <laughs> who's to say? Unless they're floating in a chair, in which case... Kill them. The worst. They're the worst. <laughs> So that's also one of the things you get various like telekinetic superpowers and shit. you can fly at some point. But one of the things you can do that's the best thing in the game is telekinesis, which is, you know, maybe you'll pick up some furniture if it's nearby to then launch at people. But if there's not really furniture nearby, you just pick up pieces of brutalist architecture to throw at people. <laughs> Chunks just come out of the stairs. Rip a chunk out of the wall, rip a chunk out of the floor. You can throw a potted plant, sure, but you can also throw the corner right there at somebody. Yeah. If you upgrade enough, you can throw other people. <laughs> you can just throw the other house ghosts. The is fine. Yeah, it'll heal. It'll be fine. Yeah. You do also get this power from a big floppy disk that had nuclear launch codes on it. Terrific. That yes. gives you telekinesis. 
So it's normal. Yeah. It's a normal thing. The television is what lets you fly. Somehow. 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 Oh, speaking of TVs, there are TVs scattered hither and yon throughout the area. Sometimes you'll find videos, full motion videos from Dr. Casper Darling, basically making informative movies about what's going on in the department. And he's played by Matthew Peretta, the guy who voiced Alan Wake. <laughs> who you might <laughs> remember as Alan Wake. He's also ripped. Yeah, it turns out he's buff. He's shredded under there. Which is great because he's just like, he's a dorky scientist in a bow tie. Yeah. But also he takes off his shirt at some point and he's ripped. He's just jacked. There's also <laughs> there's also some fun little things called the Threshold Kids. Wait a second, I've seen this guy. Where have I seen this guy? Is it? Have you seen him in the video game Control by any chance? Because that's the only place <laughs> I've ever seen him. Oh, shit. No, I think he was in Robin Hood Men in Tights. Hang on. Oh, my God. <laughs> hang on, 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 hang on. We're hanging. We're hanging. Yeah, he was in Robin Hood Men in Tights. That was Will Scarlet O'Hara. <laughs> we from Georgia. Fantastic. The first picture is of him from Robin Hood Men in Tights. If you just Google his name. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's, yep. Nice. Absolutely fantastic. Good for him. Okay. He puts in... <laughs> A killer performance in this video game. <laughs> so yeah, you also find a fun little little children's puppet series called The Threshold Kids, made by someone who took a puppet class once. <laughs> it is exactly as Candle Cove as you imagine it to be. Oh God! <laughs> if you are familiar with Candle Cove, it like some of it is like this is weird, but some of it's like this is so weird that I'm afraid in my heart now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to watch any more episodes of this show. I don't think. <laughs> It was an informative little fun children's video series about all the things that will happen to you if you are naughty in the oldest house. <laughs> Great. Turns out they made this for a couple of kids that they expected to have growing up in the oldest house. Hmm. That's weird. Turns out they made it for your brother. Yep. Mm. And the first time like I saw it, I was like, is there a daycare here? I don't want to run into that. <laughs> I really hope I don't run into the daycare here. <laughs> And then later it's like, no, this is going to be for you and your brother. And then you ran away. And instead of catching you, we just like let you be away, but kept tabs on you to see how mm -hmm. you grew in power as opposed to him under very strict loveless care where we like actively dehumanized him the whole time. Normal stuff. For him, it went pretty bad. But for you, you seem to turn out OK. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why that was it's a mystery to us all. We also have all these fun recordings of when you went to therapy about all of your childhood trauma. <laughs> and then you started talking about a poet you like named Thomas Zane, who never existed. Oh, God. Yeah, he's not real. So why do you know about him? That's so weird. That's weird. That's weird, Jesse. It's so weird, Jesse. And then also in the Panopticon, if you go to like to the really far corner, you can find a little typewriter and fucking Alan Wake will talk to you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Excuse okay, I did not know about that one. Did you not? Okay, yeah. So it's like hard to get to. It's like one of the hardest places to get to, but there is like, mm -hmm. pretty sure it's a typewriter. But if you do it, a full motion video of Ilka Killy or Ilka Villy, whatever his name is, type in and it's Casper Darling, but doing a little bit of a different voice because, you know, <laughs> Professor Darling's like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm up here and I'm happy. And then it's the same voice, but like if he was sad about, you know. <laughs> not being able to go to his cool sex parties anymore but he, he just does like a little like then jesse came and found the typewriter that talked to her in alan wake's voice and like it's over really quickly but you can find a little alan wake hidden in the corner of the panopticon oh for god's sake oh god remedy you fucks <laughs> Yeah, but okay. it's also, it sets up something, we'll get to, but it's also very important that yeah. he's, like, writing the story of control, so keep that in mind also. Jesse wanders through the departments as the new boss, tries to fix things, tries to, like, you know, at least keep things a little bit normal, like doing janitor tasks, like fighting off the clog. Yep. <laughs> if she tries to kill the refrigerator, she will meet a big... Cthulian entity with one eye and several tentacles called Former that you get a call from the board shortly after who's like, we don't know about any Former. If he tells you he used to work for us, do <laughs> not listen to him. It's fine. <laughs> we are not affiliated with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> if he offers you any better benefit packages, do not take it. 
we will be mad. <laughs> it's fine. And then the fridge is normal after that. <laughs> then it's just yeah. a regular fridge afterwards. And then in the Panopticon, actually, is where you go to find your brother who's been living in jail, who's been living in haunted object jail. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm sure he's fine. <laughs> oh, he's doing great. Before we talk any more about Dylan, I do feel like we need to just take a quick couple steps back and talk about one Ms. Emily Pope real quick. Okay. So you know how Ca Dr. Casper Darling, head of research and development, is missing? Yes. Well, Emily Pope is here now. She was his assistant, and she's now in charge. She has a clipboard and a big, bright smile. And she's your girlfriend. It's very importantly, every time you talk to each other, you're just making eyes at each other. Her and Jesse are just yep. <laughs> like, they're like, I know, look, one of us wants to ask the other one on a date, but we're busy because of the ghosts. So we can't <laughs> right now. Yeah, unfortunately, ghosts. They are the most dating ass people you have ever seen in a video game. It's so adorable. Yeah, like immediately she's like, oh, don't call me director. Call me Jesse. Jesse's just fine. Hey, I'm going to tell you first about Polaris before I tell anyone else because I trust you. You even want to perform experiments on me. Maybe that's kissing. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know a girl likes you is if she performs experiments on it's you. It's the true sign of love. Emily just has this like buzz cut and just this perky smile. She's excited about everything and she loves collating data. <laughs> I love Emily. Every time you do like any major story beat, like one of the options is you can go back and talk to Emily about it. Yeah, that's probably just business at this point. Sure. Yeah. Federal Bureau of Control. Yeah. That's just a business thing you can do is go talk to your girlfriend yeah. about what you just did. Go tell her about your day. <laughs> and like, look, again, lady with a short buzz cut and redheaded woman in a leather jacket, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> Harold. <laughs> They're girlfriends. All I'm saying is that if they don't kiss in control two, I'm calling up Sam Lake and we're gonna have a talk. <laughs> I'm a, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a talking to. <laughs> Jesse's brother Dylan is not actually in haunted jail. He actually broke out of haunted jail and now he's just in the executive sector where you work. And he is corrupted by the hiss, but like he's slightly more normal. He just kind of tilts his head and gives you a Kubrick stare most of the time. And then he tells you about his cool, normal dreams. <laughs> <laughs> like where you used to be one person named Jesse Dylan Faden, because isn't it funny that both of our names are spelled in the gender neutral way? And, mm. Hmm, hmm. and a cool dream that he had about a man named Mr. Door who stood at the nexus of all things. And a cool dream that he had about a writer who's writing a writer. <laughs> His cool dreams are just other <laughs> Remedy video games. <laughs> he has a nice time, Dylan does. I bet the only entertainment they gave Dylan when they kept him in haunted object jail was just Alan Wake's terrible airport cop <laughs> books. <laughs> and that's why he's that's like why this. That's why he's like this. <laughs> Honestly... They probably also gave him not episodes, but screenplays of Night Springs, because it turns out that there was a re-release of Night Springs, like they made a brand new season of it. And the FBC actually was behind that because they were trying to experiment on introducing like paranormal like ideas into the collective subconscious to see what that would do to the haunted objects in haunted object jail. <laughs> Just to see what would happen. There's also, you can find one of the collectibles is radio shows. It's basically coast to coast, but it's like actively fake. So whenever people will call in about the weird altered object stuff happening, they will give you an even more implausible thing, much like how if you find any clips of not coast to coast, but the people who own it now, they'll start talking as if you are three college courses deep into the conspiracy thing that they're about to tell you. And they'll just start with like, so we know how the moon's fake. And so because of that, and you're like, hold on, <laughs> I need you to go back about the moon being fake. Uh, what? And then they'll tell you <laughs> wild stuff right after that. They do this on purpose. They have a whole radio station that's just that on purpose. And that's also how they collect data. And that's also how you can't bring the internet into the oldest house, not because the internet doesn't work, but because it works and they don't want any of the haunted objects to pick up any ideas from the internet. That's a lot yeah. of collective unconscious <laughs> in there. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want any of the haunted objects turning into seven foot tall toxic green fox furries. We don't want them to learn about generative AI waifus with huge titties. And 15 fingers on each hand. <laughs> 
like, we just don't need that. <laughs> we have so many problems. <laughs> um, we just fixed the refrigerator that gets you. We can't introduce all this other stuff just yet. <laughs> So Jesse eventually figures out that the slide projector is in the oldest house, not in the haunted jail, but in a special place. And also it turns out that the hiss are actually from the slide projector from one of the other slides, which is probably why Polaris was like, hey, no reason. Let's go to the Federal (laughs) Bureau of Control. Bring a weapon. (laughs) (laughs) There's also like at some point. Probably in this, when you find out that, like, we have a whole wing that's just a slide projector, and you're like, that's probably not good. You do learn that, like, (laughs) you destroyed all of the slides. Like, that was part of getting rid of the not mother, was you just destroyed all the slides. But, wouldn't you know it, one of them survived. We got one. We kept one. Anyway. Let's have expeditions into it. Let's go there and see. It should be fine, right? And no, it wasn't fine. That's how the hiss gets out. Yeah. (laughs) And so in order to get through to where the slide projector is, it's through double security. It is through a maze that is generated around an object of power called the ashtray, which you can only unlock using a cigarette, which Trench always carried around and smoked. But, well, he's gone and we don't know where the cigarette is. But, like, it creates this, like, hotel around it, the ashtray does, that just loops back around on itself. You can't actually get through until later in the game when you're like, okay... How the hell do we get through this? I know. Let's go ask Ati the janitor. <laughs> Where's Ati? Where did Ati go? Ati's gone. Oh, he's about to go on vacation because he's. You know how you know how Finn's vacation is like religious to them. They love vacation. Like you don't you don't f- around with a Finn's vacation. Well, he's about to go on vacation, so he can't help you. But he here. <laughs> I do have a tape player, like a Walkman with a tape in it. That does have Poets of the Fall in there. That's correct. And that, they'll help you. <laughs> oh, my God. They can help you get through the ashtray maze with my, my friends the Poets of the Fall and their tape. <laughs> but it's actually Poets of the Fall credited as the old gods of Asgard. Oh, are they? Okay. They, then I'm thinking yeah. of, there's a room that you can find that is yes. like, it looks like a studio. You can just like find a song from yeah. Poets of the Fall in there. So that, that must be what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got a song in that weird room where they record like, how does this song make you feel? Do you feel like murdering afterwards? <laughs> Because you should tell us if you feel like murdering afterwards. (laughs) You have to tell us or it's a trap. It's a trap. (laughs) (laughs) That was a Poets of the Fall song. And then we also have an old Garth of Asgard song. Again, they exist in the same universe. Yeah. (laughs) And Jesse basically puts on the Walkman and the ashtray (laughs) maze starts opening up as the song Take Control starts playing. And this is our second musical interlude. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah. And this is so, I cannot stress enough how dope this whole thing is it's very cool because at this point by the time you're here you should have upgraded all of your various and sundry powers to if not the max then like pretty close because you can actually get more skill points than you have skills because you can find like hidden areas that'll just like hey you got a skill point because we don't know what else to give you here you go so like you can get maxed out at this point but when you're that powerful and you're running around this hotel that is like shape-shifting around you fighting like all these different hiss variants and whatnot like to this pretty kick-ass song about taking control of your life back it rules it's pretty great yeah and like the song is reactive so if you take a while in like a room it will just keep looping that part of the song in a fairly seamless way so like when the different parts of the song actually queue up for where you're going it's pretty seamless and like Honestly, just fucking rules. Yeah. Just imagining the audio designer who first figured out that you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> everybody on the team was like, well, wait, we know exactly what we're doing with this. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's call up Sam Lake's best friend. <laughs> we have just the guys. <laughs> they like putting their songs in video games. And like, it is absolutely like, it feels like the climax of the game because it feels like you are so powerful. And while stuff is still a challenge, you're able to like traverse it really well. It does the good job of tricking you into feeling like you're overpowered. And there's even a point where like, as you're racing through the maze, like halfway through, it's like the maze starts to help you by blocking off points where there are like other hiss coming in. It's really, really fun if you're playing it like... Not like too quickly, but if you're going at the pace that they intend, that there's like a lot of really cool things like that where like 
you'll be going down a hallway and you'll see a bunch of guys and then like the floor will fall out and they'll all fall down and there'll be a staircase for you to take next to it and like stuff like that. I only remember one area in the whole ashtray maze that I got really hung up on because there was like two tough guys and I didn't know that you can get rid of them pretty easily by just like moving past where you're supposed to be. But other than that, like, it's a really fun time. You've got this great song playing the whole time. And then finally, once you hit like the trigger point where you are at the end of the maze and Jesse is slowly taking off the Walkman, like it plays the end of the song right there. And it's one of those like, take control end. Like, so it's just on a very quick beat and it's just everything else in the game is interesting and cool, but it does not roll as hard as that. Yeah. The only other time that I felt like as cool as this part is probably when you're fighting the mirror you. Yeah. Because there's a mirror you. Yeah, there's a side quest where you can just find a haunted mirror that makes a mirror you that you have to fight and then you get her cool outfit. Yeah. Her name is Essage because it's Jesse backwards. <laughs> and yeah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And she's tough, but you and it, there's a point where you're basically because she has your powers. So you're just like grabbing chunks of floor and equipment and stuff and just you know throwing it at each other and hoping that you do it better than her it's pretty fun (laughs) yeah she's also got all the different versions of the gun that you've unlocked yeah so you get through the ashtray maze you get to 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 find the slide projector only the slide projector is not there because trench Got a little bit of the hiss in him when he went through expeditions. It drove him mad. He let the hiss in. And then he also put the slide projector somewhere else. But there is something in this wing that is very important that Casper Darling left behind an entity called Hedron, which is where he gets the Hedron resonance amplifiers, which is keeping everybody safe in their little life vests. And their cool little life jackets. Yeah. And Casper Darling is gone. Yeah. Casper Darling ascended to another plane. <laughs> He's not dead. This is how we know he's ripped is because this whole time you find videos of him being like, here's the oldest house. Here's the gun. Here's this thing. And just explaining stuff in like a Mr. Rogers kind of way, like a Bill Nye kind of like, anyway, this is the gun that has different forms and it makes you boss. Isn't that neat? That's pretty sweet. And then you find a video of him without his shirt on, like just in his boxers, like, crouching in the corner about to ascend to a different plane like i hope i'm leaving this place in good hands because trench got got and now i need to go for whatever reason and then he leaves (laughs) you're like okay what (laughs) just return to his home planet i guess pretty much basically and then you find hedron which is a gigantic geometric shape that is like a dodecahedron or an octahedron maybe that changes But it is a big shape, and Jesse realizes that it is friend-shaped. It is actually Polaris. (laughs) So that's neat that your friend that's in your head is also a big D20. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry about it. You get this sort of vision where you realize that Dylan is in charge of the Hiss and he is going to try to use the Hiss to kill Hedron, partially because, you know, Hiss mad or whatever, but also, well... Hedron did not really help him get out of his terrible (laughs) bureaucratic baby jail that he grew up in. (laughs) Yeah, and it did help you. And you just always had Polaris chilling in there, but he didn't get any of that help. So might as well kill the D20. (laughs) (laughs) So Dylan is here to kill Dungeons and Dragons with the hiss. (laughs) You have to fight them off. It's a big sort of puzzle thing. There's a lot of like things you have to do to try to free Hedron so it can escape. And you go through a big fight and then you lose and the game's over because you're corrupted by the hiss. Yep. You got got. And the like the credits play and then like halfway through the credits, the credits start like being weird and then they start melting and then the game starts and it's the worst thing you could ever imagine. You are... Just like a regular office worker, but like the lowest rung. You like It's your first day at the FBC. You got a cool new job. It's a favor from your brother. And you're getting coffee and you're making copies and delivering the mail. And all of her friends are here and they're just kinda hanging out. And they're just kinda chilling. And his is gone. And his is gone, but also though, like your girlfriend does not remember you, which I feel like this is how you know it's a nightmare, is that even Emily no. Pope <laughs> doesn't know doesn't know about you. And she keeps talking about like dreamy boys. Yeah, Which so is just nightmare. Not correct. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's like, oh, Jesse, you, you delivered these 30 pieces of mail and you cleaned up these 20 coffee cups and you copied these 20 pieces of paper. Here's some mail to take to the director. Hey, who's that janitor you just walked by? He seems normal. <laughs> <laughs> he just said something cryptic to you. My favorite part of this whole thing is because you do these tasks like two or three times before you like can start to like figure out that like you're supposed to do something different. And like Adi basically looks at you and is like, are you sure you want to be getting all those coffee cups? Come on. <laughs> yeah, Adi doesn't like tell you. He's just like, hey, so like, are you sure this is, is this right? Are you good? Does this seem right to you? You good? Adi would never lie to me. And in fact, is the only person who has addressed me as a human and not just the new office drone. So maybe I should take his advice. As things start getting more distorted as you keep looping through this, because it's not a loop, it's a spiral, <laughs> things start to get more and more distorted. Like, hiss, like sometimes it's a hiss office worker who's got this melty face who's also waiting for their mail. <laughs> sometimes you see Dylan just kind of standing and staring with his little Kubrick stare. In his, like, pajamas. Like, he's in, like, sweatpants and a sweatshirt and no socks. Like, he's just, like... He's in his prison outfit. Yeah. You go to deliver mail to Director Trench, who is starting to get more and more unhinged as you keep doing this. And then eventually, you don't even take the mail anymore. You're just like, wait a minute. This is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and you walk by to go see Director Trench, and Nadi's like, there you go. You got it. You got it. You figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then you take the service weapon, because you're the boss. <laughs> Do you shoot Trench at this point, or is that like a part of the Dylan nightmare flashback kind of deal? I don't remember. I think you shoot Trench, or he has just shot himself again or something. Yeah. You take the gun, there is shooting involved, and you also realize that like that little fragment of Polaris that was in your head was kind of unanchored from Hedron. So you still have those sorts of powers and abilities and this little like echo of Hedron in your head that is Polaris. Yeah. And then you also have to go through like the Ocean View Motel to congratulate yourself because this is your own goddamn mind. You know what's going on. And there's a little music video from Trench and Casper Darling singing about how Jesse's dynamite and she can do it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You get two musical <laughs> interludes in this game. <laughs> and then Jesse escapes the his corruption and is just like, fine, we're going to go get the slide projector and my brother. I'm the boss now. They're in the uh, department of, is it nostalgia? The nostalgia department? Yeah, the nostalgia department. And like the entire game, there's like a hallway that says like nostalgia department, but it's like blocked off with hiss and you can't go there without being hurt. And now you're like, oh, that's where I got to go. Yeah, it's like right outside your hub. I was like, hey, final area time. Now you can come on in. And you go in there and the board's like, hey, just for this one time, we're going to give you basically infinity power for like a little bit. Because <laughs> <laughs> like they're starting to break into the astral plane too, where the board is and the board's like, mm, don't like that one. Mm, too far. <laughs> don't like it. Here, have an upgrade. Upgrade slash promotion. It's fine. Slash unlock. It's yeah, it's very good. Yeah. So then you get like one hit KOs on everything. Because again, the Ashtray Maze was the climax, really. Yeah. Like gameplay wise. So this is just fun. It's just you like destroying things. And like the best part is that the fucking guys in the chairs that are the worst, you can just grab mm -hmm. them out of the air right now and throw them at their friends. <sighs> and it's so satisfying. <laughs> hate the guys in the chairs. They're awful. <laughs> You defeat Dylan, he goes into a coma, you don't know if he's ever going to wake up, but you're hopeful, because, you know, he's still your brother. And it's not really his fault that the entire Federal Bureau of Control kind of screwed him up real bad. Put him in X-Men baby jail. Yeah, that's not his, <laughs> he didn't do that to himself. <laughs> so you're like, fine, I'm the boss, I get a cool new outfit, I get a little suit, we still have to lock down the FPC because we still have hiss inside and we're not opening the doors until it's clean because God damn it, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have two DLCs. One of them canonically takes place after the game, which is Foundation, where you as the director goes down into the roots of the oldest house because it has roots, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, OK. Normal. Normal. Yeah. Normal building things. It's got roots and there's also a big black rock spike called the Nail. That is tethering it to the astral plane that they're trying to destroy. And you got to fix it. Yeah. Or else who knows what'll happen. And Because like the astral plane is starting to break into the regular world in as much as the oldest house is the regular world. <laughs> yeah. And like 
you find remnants of the expedition they made down to the roots of the oldest house where they first made contact with the board a couple generations ago and found the service weapon. And you also meet former again. The thing that was in the fridge. Yeah. 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 You meet the fridge guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The fridge guy. He's back. He got out and fridged. He's like, hey, so I see that the board is only letting you have one of these superpowers they offered you. I think you should have the other one. I think it'll be a good idea. And they're like, do not. How dare you? <laughs> we hate this. We hate you. Don't do it again. And then the board calls later like, hey, we're sorry that we uh, that we snapped. Um, <laughs> please don't go talk to Former. He's definitely not uh, trustworthy, unlike us. We, You know what? It's actually okay that you have the second power. We wanted you to have it. We, ap- we approve <laughs> of that, and it's fine. <laughs> there is also a little bit in there where there, because like a lot of one of the tricks of the oldest house, there are areas that are just like you can't go over there because it's a bottomless pit. So like you know, there's like big distances and stuff. The whole like foundation area, half of it is like bottomless pit, and there's like a little tram you got to ride to get to some places. But after you talk <laughs> to the former, and the board's like, hey, sorry about that. Um, you can have the second power. Please don't talk to the former again. He doesn't work for us for sure. We are not affiliated. You just see him in the house, like in the distance, this big ass one-eyed guy and he's like hey thanks and then leaves <laughs> <laughs> and then that's the last we see of him i think so i'm excited to see yeah. how they kind of pull that back around in the next one yeah because like you have the board that seems like interesting and weird but also definitely like knows what it's doing and then over the course of foundation you're like oh they don't know what they're fucking doing at all do they at best they don't know what they're doing at worst like they're going to be the next bad guys <laughs> is the board. Because Jesse basically takes this DLC and she's like, OK, we are not going to trust the board blindly. We're going to do this our own way. And I am going to lead the bureau and figure things out whether or not the board approves the giant black pyramid. <laughs> the upside down black pyramid in the astral plane that gives me <laughs> that orders. calls me on the phone. <laughs> that calls me on the telephone. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's the AWE DLC, which this time does stand for Alan Wake Experience. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's right. He's back in a major way. And a major way is making Jesse's job and life so <laughs> fucking hard for no reason. Because <laughs> <laughs> in the dark place, it seems like Alan Wake has discovered that he needs to write a story that does not feature him as the hero because he was bad at that last time. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go great. <laughs> He needs a competent lady to be his hero and save him. (laughs) And he has decided because he's discovered over time that the dark place doesn't seem like it can create things wholesale, but it can manipulate pre-existing things and nudge them in different directions. So he's like, so here's this cool lady called Jessie. Maybe she will save me. (laughs) Help me save me. Help me save me. me. Please, please. I'm stuck. And, and I she's need... like, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm a shitty writer. Yeah, because this is even DLC that you can do in the middle of the video game. Yeah. You just take a hard <laughs> detour to Alan Wake land. There's like literally <laughs> like one of the areas is just like, this is the Alan Wake zone. Like this is where we kept all the stuff from Alan Wake's times. You can just go over there now. It's a different elevator. You can just go over there. Here's a stripped down version of the art assets we had for this <laughs> set from Alan Wake. Yeah. So Jesse discovers the investigation sector, which, you know, does have other jobs, but right now it's basically just the sector that's about Alan Wake. <laughs> Their entire job is figuring out what the f*** is going on in Alan Wake. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you remember the evil mental health expert, Dr. Emil Hartman? Oh, God. <laughs> well, he got corrupted by the dark place, and then the hiss came, and he got double corrupted? <laughs> <laughs> and, and f*** this guy in particular. <laughs> <laughs> For the rest of the DLC, when referring to Hartman, they consistently call him the third thing. Because he's not, a, he's not a take it, he's not a hiss. He's just some other thing now. He's a secret third thing. <laughs> <laughs> he's a secret third thing. He's the secret third thing. And he is the toughest boss, I think, in the game for me. He's, you know, he's, he's invented a whole new gender. <laughs> so, like, the whole sector is, like, corrupted with darkness. You don't hold a flashlight. You're Jesse goddamn Fade and... You telekinetically hold a flashlight with one hand in front of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hands free, motherfucker. Yeah. One of those hands is doing a telekinetic thing, but you know. It's fine. It's fine. Sometimes you do pick up like a giant 
block of generator energy and you plug that into something and that'll turn the lights on for you so you don't have to worry about holding a flashlight yeah the fbc functions on big telekinetic blocks (laughs) are there gigantic batteries and they are not duracell brand so i don't know (laughs) if i can trust them or not (laughs) (laughs) and like there is this point when you actually pass through the ocean view motel again except this time the spiral door is open a crack And you look in. It's the only time you've ever been able to go into the other one. And I was so stoked. And I get in there and it's just like a guy is in there. He's like, what's up? (laughs) I'm Tom Zane. (laughs) Yeah, it turns out Alan Wake's in here with also Alan Wake with a doppelganger that maybe is Mr. Scratch, but also is like, hey, what's up? I'm Thomas Zane. I'm really Thomas Zane. And I was never a poet. I was always a filmmaker. I was a poet in a movie. <laughs> Let's work together to escape the dark place and drink. It's fine. It's totally fine and chill. <laughs> it's totally fine and also chill. I also look like Ilkavilli. Is that on purpose? I don't know. <laughs> well, who's to say? <laughs> who's to say? That's your only real, like, direct exposure to Alan Wake. There's some, like, secret things you can find that actually, in hindsight, call forward to Alan Wake 2, which is great. Apparently, there's, like, a secret area you can access by playing Poets of the Fall. uh, Sorry, Old Gods of Asgard's (laughs) take control. There are parts that play backwards. Oh. And what you do, you unscramble those parts And you get clues to a secret location where you get some more Alan Wake narration that are about Tor and Odin retiring to Valhalla Rest Home. Oh, okay. (laughs) But you also get a phrase that is part of how you find this secret location, but it's also in their drunken, feverish state seem to both profoundly the pyramid in the stolen file becomes a spruce tree. Huh. (laughs) Which is about a thing in Alan Wake 2. Is it? I don't remember. Yeah, it's about how they came up with the cult of the tree. Oh. Yeah. Huh. That's neat. Yeah. (laughs) That's pretty neat. And like the article that I read is like, I think this must refer to the oldest house because there's some tree pictures and... Oh, no, you just don't know yet. They just haven't told you yet what that is actually about. (laughs) Because they've been making this game for 13 years. (laughs) Yeah. And so, like, you go through the investigation sector. You also eventually find out that Alan Wake may or may not have created the Hiss invasion. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah. I don't think he did, but he did write the poem that the Hiss corrupted people keep reciting. Great job, Alan. Yeah. Yeah. It's at this point in the game where I was like, Alan, I swear to God, <laughs> if you <laughs> if you did this to Jesse, why do you just come in and ruin everyone's lives? Can't you just take a <laughs> knee for like five minutes, please? My initial reaction was just like, Alan Wake may have done this to Jesse. And it was just like, get a job. Stay away <laughs> from her. <laughs> you also can get some more jobs from Atsuki, who is on vacation, but left you some janitorial tasks. <laughs> And if you do all of them, you get a little vacation postcard from Atsi outside a sauna in beautiful, watery Washington. Hmm. Weird. The best janitor side quest is go talk to the plants. And so there's just like... <laughs> oh, yeah. There's like six plants. You just have to go to... And like Jesse just like... It's like, hey, how's it going, plant? So you're a plant. What's that about? And then by the sixth one, you're like, I'm going to miss it when I don't have to talk to the plants anymore. And it's like, oh, Jesse, <laughs> she's friends with the plants now. Because <laughs> unlike the plants are dead and then you talk to them and they instantly like re-greenify and perk back up. Yeah. Very cute. It's very good. So the DLC ends with you defeating the third thing, Dr. <laughs> Emil Hartman, outside some reused assets from his little like health retreat in Alan Wake. And also, don't worry, of course, you have to plug in several cubes of light to Obviously. get things to turn on. Oh, good. I was worried. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It also ends with a weird statement that you have received a distress signal from Bright Falls, Washington, indicating that there's an active altered world event going on there. But it's dated as being from several years in the future. (laughs) I wonder what that could be referring to. Perhaps in 2023. Hmm, Gee, I wonder what year that could possibly be. (laughs) Because that's also the thing is that you will have this confirmed in Alan Wake 2. All of these video games take place in the year in which they are released. So Alan Wake takes place in 2010. Control takes place in 2019. Alan Wake 2 will take place in 2023. Oh, he's been in there for so long. Yep. (laughs) 
That man, I hope that Control 2 doesn't do that or else it's like Jesse's been stuck in the oldest house for at least four years now and counting. So, yeah, because you definitely find a document in Alan Wake 2 that implies that the oldest house might still be shut down in 2023, which is like, don't, though. Don't, though, please. How do they get food? Let Jesse see the sun. (laughs) She needs some vitamin D. She's going to (laughs) get so sad in there. So, Alan Wake 2, released in 2023. They've been trying to make this game since 2010, hand to God. Sam Lake finally got to make his little video game about a shitty writer. (laughs) Thanks to Control doing very well financially, they were finally allowed to just make the game they've been trying to make for so long. And also, maybe they were just waiting for Shannon Maynard to finish the first one. (laughs) (laughs) I hear that they actually, like, bought the rights back to Alan Wake from Microsoft. They did. So now they just get to make whatever funky little video game Sam, like, wants to make. Because in Control, like, before the DLC, like, they bought it between making Control and making the Alan Wake DLC. Because, like, all that Alan Wake stuff doesn't actually refer to him by name. It's like, it'll say, like, Bray Falls and it'll, like, clearly outline the events. But it's very much like, we don't have the rights to this yet. So we're here. But then they're like, anyway, here's Alan Wake. (laughs) Here he is on the screen. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) Alan Wake. You've been waiting for so long. Here he is, this shitty little writer. (laughs) God's worst writer. Here he is. He has been stuck in the darkness for 13 years because he's not actually a good enough writer to get out. (laughs) He can't write himself out. He's not very good at this. You are just going to keep finding other people that get trapped in the dark place who get out so much faster. (laughs) This one actually has two protagonists. Well, one of them is Alan Wake, who is wandering through the dark place and trying to escape. Sure. And then you have the one built for the people who did not play gameplay wise, mediocre, but narratively interesting video game Alan Wake in 2010. (laughs) And you have Saga Anderson, an FBI agent who is investigating Bright Falls and the surrounding area. And you have these cool mechanics for both of these characters. Alan Wake has the writer's room where you go to his shitty little typewriter and he's got a little (laughs) chalkboard. And a little desk with some note cards in it. (laughs) And he is trying very hard to outline. And learn how to outline stories. He's not very good at it. He is slowly learning how to write a second draft of a book. (laughs) And he's just trying to write himself into escaping the dark place, usually by going deeper into the dark place, because he does not learn. He's never once learned, and he's not starting now. (laughs) Go up! (laughs) Up! Up, Alan, up! And meanwhile, with Saga, you have the mind place, which she says is like her like mind palace technique thing where she basically just like recreates a nice little lodge and she has all her collectibles and little memories and little items that she's gotten over the course of her career. And she also has like a red string conspiracy board on one side, which is how you actually keep track of like things you uncover and plot elements and push the plot forward while Saga makes deductions. It rules. It's really, really, I haven't played the game, but I've I've watched an entire playthrough of it, and it seems like the best possible pause screen, because <laughs> it's just like, you hit pause, you go into the mind place, and it's like, hey, here's all the characters that you've met that might be important to what you're doing right now. In case you've forgotten, this is their pictures, and here's what they're doing. You're all in your 30s now, you play video games for a half hour at a time. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. You don't have the operational memory to keep track of what you were doing last time. It also works just instantaneously. Like, it is very much taking advantage of the fact that, like, modern consoles can just load like nothing. It is keeping this whole second, like, interactive environment just on pause for you that you can just go back to at literally any time with no delay. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Saga Anderson is here with her partner, Alex Casey, who is a real person? Unrelated, but everyone knows about the books because they're super bestsellers. And so he oh, he's always getting guff about being named the same thing as that guy <laughs> from the Alan Wake books. Wouldn't you know it? And looking exactly like Sam Lake. He is played by Sam Lake and voiced by the guy who voiced Max Payne. So yep. <laughs> there's that. So he kind of brought it on himself. <laughs> Saga is investigating a series of murders, all involving victims who went missing in 2010 in Bright Falls during the first Alan Wake game. And they all seem to be connected to some organization that calls itself the Cult of the Tree, which they're all like, who just calls themselves a cult? (laughs) (laughs) 
And then there's a second cult, and they're like, come on now. Like, <laughs> Wait, we're at cult saturation for this small town. It's too many cults. You gotta pick one. Too many cults for one town, easily. Saga is married. She has a husband and a young daughter named Logan who are back home on the other side of the country. Gosh, they're just so into the new season of Night Springs. They're really excited about it. They love it so much. <laughs> So Saga investigates some of these th- because there's just this new body that's washed up on the shore that seems like it's got some like weird cult things on it. And it's on the shores of the flooded Cauldron Lake. You remember the FBI agent who was like, I just got to kill Alan Wake because he wrote me bad. <laughs> well, that's him. That's his <laughs> body. He got et by the dark place. Remarkably well preserved for 13 years underwater, just getting yeah, spit up. But that's him now. And it's that's his body. It's fine. It's normal. Also, a lot of Cauldron Lake, including all of the campgrounds, have been locked up by the Federal Bureau of Control. There's a bunch of signs everywhere that are like, just do not. It's fine. <laughs> Please don't come in here. We've got a monitoring station here that monitors volcanic activity. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. Uh, (laughs) I'm sure that's not going to be relevant at all. Nah, Nah, it's normal stuff. Saga and KC investigate. They also find a couple of mysterious typewriter written pages that mention Saga and KC by name, mostly Saga, which is probably not great. Usually it isn't. In this town, I wouldn't want my name on a piece of paper anywhere. So he's just picked a second competent woman to try and get him out of there. Yes. Well... (laughs) It worked pretty good the first time, so he's like, all right, (laughs) now I think I know what my angle is. And I'll involve Alex Casey, my favorite character from my shit books. Who I will remind you, killed. (laughs) He's dead in the books. (laughs) That's probably also going to be fine. I did kill this guy off. Yeah. So they take this body back to autopsy at the sheriff station. They meet Tim Breaker, the current sheriff, who is the cousin of the lady who should not have been a cop in the first game. He's the sheriff now. Don't worry about it. He's also played by Sean Ashmore from Quantum Break. Quantum Break. Where you had time powers. Also the Animorphs live action TV series. (laughs) He did play Jake in the Animorphs. That's true. He played Jake in Animorphs? Yes. He played Jake in Animorphs. Yeah. Holy shit. That's the primary thing I associate Sean, all the things that Sean Ashmore has been in. I'm like, yeah, he was an Animorphs. <laughs> he was Jake and Animorphs. Amazing. <laughs> I've been a fan of his since then, because number one, I liked Animorphs, and number two, back in the mid-90s, there was a drought of characters that were cool named Jake. I had one. I was going to say. And it was Jake from Animorphs, so I latched onto that guy. Also, <laughs> have a deep abiding crush on Brooke Nevin, because she played Rachel in the show. What are you going to do? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that just tracks. Tim Breaker is like, oh, yeah, you found Mysterious Pages? So have we. Here, have one. Oh, no! And then he disappears. <laughs> <laughs> he gets head up. It's so weird. He just blinks out of existence. And then, oh, what's this? Oh, the corpse woke up and it's taken. And now we have to like stay in the light where Taken can't see us and then shoot them and get a flashlight. Oh, we're doing this again. But, but this time, Saga can run for like a little while. <laughs> <laughs> She's not an out of shape writer who's spent the last two years exclusively going to drug and sex parties. She has like. <laughs> physical training and can run for a little bit and also the batteries are not sponsored by Duracell and last longer and if I was Duracell I would have sent them a letter for sure (laughs) for all we know they did so Saga ends up fighting off the Taken who then disappears she makes her way back to Cauldron Lake and she's like okay fine the story says I go to Cauldron Lake on these pages why not let's do it sure what the hell by the way she also passes an FBC monitoring station that is now blaring an alert and if you go inside the computers say warning AWE in progress which is probably fine <laughs> and she's like is that sound for Alan Wake event and they're like no don't worry <laughs> yeah, it's the Alan Wake experience. <laughs> she also can find, like, as a collectible little nursery rhyme situation set up with a whole bunch of creepy dolls where she has to, like, reenact nursery rhymes that some FBC person has been writing and make them alter reality because they're just doing those sorts of experiments. <laughs> Just to see what happens. Just to see what happens. Can't leave well enough alone, that FBC. There is something to be said for an organization that just lets you do weird shit to see what happens. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a good idea 100% of the time, but it does sound like a fun place to work. Oh, yeah. So, look, you might disappear, but you'll have fun before that. <laughs> and hey, the people that don't disappear, they're going to get some great data. Absolutely. <laughs> Saga 
takes the heart that got cut out of this corpse and performs a ritual with it that opens up a place that they call the overlap. The FBC has a different name for them, but they're like, oh yeah, it's a threshold. You've got like alternate realities blocking over here. We should probably close that up. But Saga's just like, I'm gonna go in. <laughs> And she does this thing. She'll do this thing several times with other thresholds where like things loop about three or four times and are slightly different each time because it's not a loop, it's a spiral. (laughs) And then she'll finally like find the take and fight it and then also have this weird vision where she has like this staticky conversation with Alan Wake. And the first time she's like, what the f*** is this? Who are you? What is happening? And he's like, I'm trapped in the dark place. Help me. (laughs) <laughs> and she's like why are you in my brain he's like i gotta get out and she's like i know that i know you need to get out of here right now and so after defeating this take and saga wakes up back on the shores of cauldron lake the floodwaters have receded and also next to her there's a man in the suit face down in the sand who has a few pages of a novel with him and oh no it's alan wake they said dirty dirty alan wake oh no you got him out <laughs> you got alan wake out <laughs> <laughs> There's your problem. Don't let him out of the box. (laughs) (laughs) Now we reach the point where you are able to like start jumping back and forth at like little checkpoints consistently. Little buckets of water that have janitor markings with them and a poster next to them for a band called Ati and the Janitors. That's interesting. Huh. And you can Mm. use these puddles of water to jump back and forth between Saga's story and Alan's story. But we're just going to like jump through Alan's story here real quick. Because Alan just keeps doing the same shit over and over again because he's a dumb bitch with terrible taste who refuses to learn. (laughs) And he will never learn. (laughs) (laughs) That is a promise. (laughs) <laughs> so Alan is in the dark place, which is in this game, it is a big, rainy, dark version of New York City because Alan just keeps thinking in shitty noir cop novels. He can't not. <laughs> Alan, no, this is exactly your problem. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And it's just going to get worse for him <laughs> the more he does it. What's interesting for Alan is that he'll be going through here chasing murder sites that are somehow connected to what Saga's doing. He will fight shadows. He will use a flashlight. He'll go through these parts of New York City that are warping and changing. But it always starts in the same place. It starts in the green room of a late night talk show called In Between with Mr. (laughs) Door. Oh, we've heard him. Yeah. Yeah. He was in a weird dream Dylan had. Yeah. A cool dream that Dylan had and may or may not be related to Mr. Hatch. And... Mr. Door has a house band on his talk show called The Old Gods of Asgard. Oh, great. <laughs> yep. And they're young. They're young people. They're not ancient elderly men, but they are definitely poets of the fall in costumes. <laughs> like 100%. <laughs> so every time Mr. Door interviews Alan in an FMV sequence about a new book that he doesn't remember writing and movie adaptations he doesn't remember signing off on. And oh, hey, check it out. Here's Sam Lake, who's playing Alex Casey in the Alex Casey movies. Isn't this fun? This whole time, Alan is just like, what is happening? And they're like, of course, Alan, great book. And he's like, what? What are, what are we doing here? <laughs> it's implied that Mr. Door knows everything that's going on. He's just kind of fucking with Alan for yeah. fun, not even to like trap him or anything. He's just hanging out. He's just having a good time with this terrible writer. <laughs> At the expense of a bad writer. One thing that Alan also discovers as he wanders through the dark place is a strange janitor named Ati, (laughs) who seems to know about how the dark place functions and gets him an angel lamp from a shoebox in the basement of the TV studio, which is missing its clicker. That's weird. (laughs) Oh, geez. Huh. What a coincidence. And this is where, like, Alan's actually able to manipulate the dark place with, like, stuff that he writes by finding new keywords to change the environment or using light to change, like, what is or isn't happening in a certain location. So that's absolutely what they kind of wanted to do with the dark place. But now they can actually do it by being able to, like, hold multiple instances of an environment in the same place. There's, like, a part in, like, a subway where it's like, do you want this to be a mystery or a horror? And depending on which one changes, like, the layout and what happens there. And then, like, the light bulb thing is like you can take this light bulb out and it will change the way the area is or you can put the light bulb in over here and it'll open up this little snack bar and you can get some bullets in there (laughs) one thing that happens 
while we're doing this is, uh, oh, also real quick, he also meets Sheriff Breaker, who just Tim Breaker's just in the dark place now. And he's got a whiteboard and he's making his own little conspiracy board that's all about Mr. Door, <laughs> who is a man who apparently he's been seeing in his dreams his entire life. <laughs> that seems fine. Every time you find him, he's like, oh, hey, what's up? I'm Tim Breaker. I'm trying to map this place, but it really sucks in here. <laughs> And he's like, do you remember me? Because like everybody that Alan Wake keeps encountering act as though they have seen him before. Alan just doesn't remember, which seems to be just what's happening here. Yeah. He also will encounter Thomas Zane, who is played by Ilka Vili and voiced by Ilka Vili this time. So, you know, he just meets a guy who looks exactly like him. He's definitely a movie guy now. He makes films. He has never made poetry. Why would you think that? <laughs> that's boring. Films are cool. And that's what I do. <laughs> It'll actually like reenact in a different way the conversation that Jesse overhears, which is wild. Oh, it does it? That's neat. Yeah, yeah. The first conversation that you have with like Tom Zane in the Overlook Hotel, by the way, in room 665, which is a totally normal number. It's sort of a rehash rewrite of the conversation that Jesse overhears with like the Alan Wake model from Control. Oh, that's neat. Also, neighbor of the beast. Ha ha ha. <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny. So one thing that happens in one of the repetitions that Alan has in his loop is that, well, his memory's a little scattered. It seems like he keeps forgetting what's been happening. And Remedy Entertainment was like, you know, there's pretty good odds that like people will have been playing Alan Wake too, who never played Alan Wake. So let's tell them about the Alan Wake story and his backstory in the first video game. And let's do it in song. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it is... A very long song. It is a nine to 20 minute musical <laughs> interlude. Like, oh, like the God. quickest you can get through it is like, yeah, nine minutes. It, but like if you're like wandering around, it's just playing. It's called Herald of Darkness. Or Champion of Light. Champion of Light. They're talking about the Herald of Darkness. And it's very long. And then there it does culminate with a dance number performed in live action by all the people who play everybody. And Sam Lake, the guy who wrote the game. If you can imagine, terrible dancer, but he's trying his best. And he's having so much fun, it looks like. They're all doing the worst, dorkiest choreography. There's people that are just in like black stocking masks to represent the Taken from the first video game. <laughs> and like you've got Ilka Vili, who is not singing in English, but is very much trying hard to. And he also just looks <laughs> confused the whole time. I like to think that's a choice that he's like, Alan would be confused. So so am I. <laughs> oh, totally. It's like a musical interview between Mr. Door and Alan Wake about his tragic backstory. You play through this by walking through these elaborate stages and set pieces while this stuff is playing on screens all around you. There's even like gaffer's tape marking your path and like certain cues and things like wait for guitar solo. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. If you take too long in certain areas and that song part is passed, it does the same reactive thing where it loops, like in Take Control, except this time on the screen you have members of the old gods of Asgard or Mr. Door just kind of politely pointing you towards where you need to go in the room. <laughs> oh my god. You also get a flare gun for the first time, which insta-kills Taken, and you get a ton of ammunition for it. So it's the same kind of thing where you're just killing Taken left and right. You're doing amazing. You're having a great time. You're just like mowing down waves. And then at the end of it, you change the environment into a glorious finale where everyone is dancing and doing little kicks and the goofiest choreography ever. And there's confetti. There's a lot of like moving your hands upwards while doing like spirit fingers and then doing a little spin. But like nobody is confident in it. And everyone is just like, I guess we're doing this. And then it's very <laughs> goofy, but it feels very earnest, at least. I mean, they're all in suits and everything, so no one is prepared to do little dances here. <laughs> no. And they performed like a six minute version of this at the Game Awards in 2023, where you just get the live oh, action God. one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. And the best part is that like halfway through the song, that's when Sam Lake shows up for the final verse to do the little dances. And that's just Sam Lake in a suit with all of his OCs. Just, he's having the time of his life. With his buddies band from high school, <laughs> who are also dressed up as their OCs. Oh, the dream. And there's just this big explosion at the end. And like just on the backdrop of that, it just plays Alan Wake 2. 
So it's like, show me the champion of life. Boo! Little kicks, little dances, little choreography. <laughs> Play Alan Wake 2, the horror survival game. What is this game about? <laughs> that. That mostly. <laughs> Oh, God. Apparently, they kept trying to get Sam to cut this because it was just too silly in a horror game. And he's like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> he would not be moved. They gave him too much power. <laughs> <laughs> I will not cut this in my horror game. I will cut literally anything else but this. <laughs> this is like when James Wan kept adding weird little crab men to Aquaman. So that's basically the best part of Alan Wake 2. But also you have Alan Wake like... <laughs> Getting weird messages from Thomas Zane to go to the Overlook Hotel, which has the same alternate world door symbols in them, except you can't go to the upside down triangle one to go see how Jesse's doing. Because <laughs> stay away from her. She's busy. She's so busy right now. <laughs> Uh, he also goes to Parliament Tower, which is like the apartment complex where he and his wife lived in like the penthouse or something because writer money. <laughs> He got that writer one. <laughs> sure, why not? Look, airport cop books sell, <laughs> and he's gonna get the good house about that. <laughs> you get these visions while you're there of how Alice has been for the last 13 years, which is not great, actually. Oh, God. Because she's been harassed by Mr. Scratch just showing up in her house and screaming at her. Looking like her dead husband. Yeah. So Alice decides to turn it into art and makes a photography exhibit about her experiences. Sets up like elaborate motion sensor things to take pictures of Mr. Scratch and also just like makes artistic photographs of the dark place stuff. She eventually gets a little more screwed up each time. You know, she's not doing so hot because, you know, all of that. She's married to Alan Wake. Also, it turns out in the apartment, Alan Wake's office, the writer's room is marked by a spiral on the door. So that's interesting. That's something. Hmm. Anyway, he keeps going through these murder sites, changing the environment, having these weird little garbled messages with Saga. They're out of temporal sync because they are encountered at different points for each character. And Alan eventually discovers that Alice has not been doing so hot to the point where her final message is that she said, I'm going to make a choice not a lot of you will understand. Uh-oh. Yeah. And her final photographs are her outside Cauldron Lake, jumping off a cliff. Hooray. And drowning. Uh, yep. In Cauldron Lake. Oh, great. The entire plot of the first game for nothing. Yay. Well. Except Alan also finds some photos that Ati points him towards that Alice took. That is a bullet made out of light and the clicker. And he's instructed to put those in the shoebox before he goes to Parliament Tower the last time. And then his part of the game is over for a while because then you go and play everything that Saga's doing because Saga's doing the better stuff. <laughs> the, the much more interesting saga can run for more than 15 feet at a time she, she can move so fast for like a wicked long time alan could never no saga is tracing the cult of the tree back to the nearby town of watery washington where she meets the Coskella brothers who have some amazing commercials own a terrible amusement park called coffee world run a biker gang that does community projects own a small trailer where saga lived with her daughter definitely that's a real thing Coffee World is so weird because it is exactly a small town amusement park based around coffee to the point where I would believe that Sam Lake had one of these in his hometown. <laughs> like he just, <laughs> he just knew this place from before. Saga is discovering that it seems like everyone here in Watery seems to know her, even though she's never been here before. And they also keep offering condolences about Logan, her daughter, who is supposed to be alive at home. She called her on the phone earlier. Yeah. So Alan Wake's been f***ing up somebody else's life. <laughs> Great job, Alan. He just can't help himself. <laughs> There's also a bit where the old gods of Asgard, who are old men, are like, hey, what's up? You're our granddaughter. And she's like, I guess so. What? <laughs> And that's a whole part of the story now. Because they're like, oh, yeah, you know, you, you definitely lived here and then you moved away and then you and your husband had some troubles. So you took your daughter and you moved back to Watery and then Logan drowned in an accident and you didn't take it so hot. And we're just hoping you're doing OK, Saga. And she's like, I'm sorry, Alan put my daughter in the story to put her in. Oh, this 
fucking guy. <laughs> I'm going to kill that little geek. <laughs> I'm going I'm to kick his <laughs> ass so bad. Also, Tor and Odin seem to be aware that there's a story going on, but they're still kind of affected by it. Maybe they've been drinking a lot of the moonshine, maybe other reasons. Saga keeps going through these overlaps to recede the waters of Cauldron Lake, to find the clicker because Alan needs it, because as it will be explained to her later, the clicker basically acts as an amplifier for any kind of like story-based changes to reality. So they just need him to write a better ending that doesn't <laughs> endanger any Saga's family. They're doomed. <laughs> They're doomed. <laughs> yeah. And maybe fix his shitty book, because Alan seems to have new pages of a shitty book that also has been hand edited by Alan is pretty sure it's Mr. Scratch that did it, but maybe he did it? It's not going so hot. They look the same, so it's hard to tell. Halfway through the story, the cult of the tree tries to kill Alan because they have probably correctly deduced that Alan is responsible for a lot of dumb <laughs> shit that's going on. <laughs> First off, Saga realizes that the wacky Finn Koskella brothers are actually in charge of this cult that is calling itself the cult of the tree on purpose for fun. There is also the cult of the word. Which is in the stories. It's a secret. Different cult. Separate cult, totally different. And also the Federal Bureau of Control is here and they're like, oh my God, this shit keeps happening. Why are it? Stop. Stop. Can everyone stop? I mean, at this point, like y'all had four years to get something together on this side. <laughs> you got the call from the future four years ago. You could have done something. They're talking about how the oldest house is like cut off and that better be a new thing. God damn it. I, I really hope so. <laughs> that better not be the same problem from four years ago. Oh, that's rough. The Federal Bureau of Control, they arrest Alan Wake, finally, and they take over the sheriff's station as their base of operations. Alex Casey is now missing, but Saga is like, okay, fine, well, I've been removed from the case by the other government agency? Anyway. <laughs> that no one really knows about? Yeah, I'm not sure how the jurisdiction shakes out there, but... Yeah. Let's go to a retirement home where apparently Tor and Odin live that might be my family for real? And also, guess who's on vacation here at the Valhalla Rest Home? <laughs> Just a weird Finn guy. <laughs> yeah. He likes singing really depressing polka on karaoke. <laughs> he keeps stealing the janitor's outfit to wear and mop up around the house, even though the woman who's caring for him is like, sir, you really don't have to do that. Obviously, we keep telling you not to. You can't stop him. Janitor's got a Janet. Just... Don't stop Otzi. Let him do whatever he wants. <laughs> Let him run. Whatever he's doing, it works. <laughs> <laughs> also, next to Otzi's room up in the attic of this Valhalla rest home that has been here since 2014, but it's also always been here, maybe, but it's also never been here. <laughs> There's a room marked with a spiral up in the attic right next to Otzi's room. And if you try and go in and open it, he appears from all the way downstairs to say don't. <laughs> <laughs> I would don't. If I were her, I would just don't. <laughs> if Otzi tells me don't, I'm going to don't. I know that about myself. <laughs> Saga discovers that Tor and and Anderson are, in fact, her real relatives. But basically, Tor Anderson was a real shit dad. And her mother, Freya, was just like, no, I'm gone. Goodbye. Seemed to be something that happened with Saga's father. Some kind of argument. And Freya was just like, no, I'm taking my daughter and leaving. A uh, goodbye. And then Tor wrote a very sad song about it. <laughs> like you do. When you're like you do when you're an old god of Asgard. And it also turns out that the Andersons all come from a line of seers. And that's why the story doesn't affect them so much. And that's why Saga is able to use weird paranatural powers to solve mystery cases. We're getting to the point where there's too much story in this story. There's <laughs> yes. a lot. My eyes are starting to cross. There's a lot. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if it's earlier. At some point, someone's like, yeah, your mind place, that's a psychic power. And she's like, no, that's just a normal thing that everyone can do. And they're like, it super isn't. And she's like, eh, we'll see. And then now it's like, no, you're from a line of seers. And she's like, maybe the mind place is a special <laughs> power that I have. It's like, yeah, thank you, Saga. Thank you for finally getting here. Saga eventually finds the clicker and she tries to bring it to Alan Wake at the police station. But wouldn't you know it, the police station is being attacked by Tegan because the FBC are bad at their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> four years. Four years. You have four years to wind up for this. The agent in charge of this is Agent Estevez, who is a divorced lesbian, who is great. <laughs> 
like at some point she and Alex Casey hang out and they talk about like how they both deserve better than their ex wives. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> and also, it turns out that Alan Wake has been Mr. Scratch this entire time that he has been here. They think it's actually they're both the same people. Whatever. They go to Cauldron Lake to try to use the clicker to perform a ritual to bring Alan Wake back to the real world, back from the dark place, because it turns out they think he's still trapped there, and they need a piece of art to do it about bringing Alan Wake out, because that's how the dark place works. So Saga's like, so it turns out I'm related to the old gods of Asgard. <laughs> oh, god damn it. <laughs> and they do a second musical interlude with lots of ammo and explosions and rock music, because this game rules, actually. <laughs> This one is all about cranking lights, too. There's a lot of cranking lights up to trap Mr. Scratch, and you gotta hope he doesn't whip you around <laughs> before you can crank the thing all the way up. <laughs> they also bring the light cubes back from the NPC. <laughs> oh, good. I missed them. <laughs> They're like, we brought them with us. <laughs> it's the only way we know how to power things. <laughs> oh, but we can't telekinetically throw them into stuff, so you just kind of have to press a button on them. Yeah, they're on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> we got a dolly. <laughs> so the ritual kind of works. The dark place is expunged from Alan Wake. And also it turns out that it did bring back Alan Wake, but it brought him way back at the beginning of the game. And that's why he appeared out of the dark place. So Saga did it to herself just much later. Womp womp. Poor Saga. The Dark Presence, which is now out of Alan Wake, decides to infect Agent Casey instead, who then throws Saga into the waters of Cauldron Lake and escapes back into Bright Falls to perform the final deer fest. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the final deer fest? The final yeah. deer fest. <laughs> Working title ass names. When he gets, like, possessed by the Dark Place, he goes, like, full Max Payne. Like, he's, like, in the trench coat, not, like, the regular FBI outfit. He's in his, like, noir-ass duds, and it's very funny that he's like, finally, I can be Max Payne again <laughs> for the final deer fest. You find out that Odin and Tor Anderson have just waded into the waters of Cauldron Lake to go after Saga, and I guess that's why they're the house band for Mr. Dor. Yeah, that makes sense. Who, by the way, at some point, when Alan's like, wait a minute, this is all stupid. And he's like, you're right, it is. I just thought you wanted to, like, have a little bit of levity, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> also, don't mess with me or my family ever again. What could that mean? Because it is deeply implied that Mr. <laughs> Dor is actually Saga's missing father. <laughs> oh, Jesus. There's a bit about how he was struck by lightning and became untethered from... So there's only one Mr. Door in all realities now, and it's like the same guy, like he's in all of them, from Lightning, probably from Tor's Hammer, maybe? It's hard to say. I hope they never fully explain that. So anyway, Alan goes back to town for Final Deer Fest to find that the horror that culminates in this entire novel is, it's an idyllic, bright, sunny day in Bright Falls, and everyone is in deer masks, and they're talking about how great Alan Wake's shitty cop book is. It's oh, God. so, it's <laughs> so it. funny. Every single person praising him is just saying, like, you think he's going to do this thing, but then he did this other thing. It's like, that's just kind of how stories go most of the time. Like That's called writing? Yeah, it's mostly just like, he, they're like, whoa, he wrote another book. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like, you find a video of someone doing a book review, uh, and he is literally just describing the book itself. <laughs> he describes the synopsis on the back as riveting and says that the book weighs less than other books. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Also, yeah, everybody is in Deer Mass. It's very like eyes wide shut. <laughs> it's a little weird. So he gets the novel. He tries to write a brand new ending by escaping to the writer's room, which, as it turns out, is behind that spiral door in the attic, which is fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Saga in the dark place is trapped in her mind place and forced to confront all of her fears and self-doubt with like her conspiracy board where she just keeps having to hang up pictures that it's like, you killed your daughter, you killed your daughter, you are a terrible partner, you let Alex Casey down, you're losing your mind. Until Saga's just like, wait a minute. <laughs> Hold up, this is stupid. <laughs> this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is bullshit. My friends and family love me and I'm doing my best. And then she just walks out of her mind place. <laughs> so it took Alan Wake 13 years and yeah. outside assistance to get out of the dark place. And Saga's just like, 
actually, no, I don't like it here. No, thank you. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense to me. (laughs) Yeah. Saga and Jesse should hang out, honestly. They should. And Saga's just like, wait a minute, this is stupid. And she leaves. She ends up in the, like, dark place New York City that Alan created and basically just, like, picks up a manuscript page about Mr. Door who can just wander through these places because he's not bound to it. And it's cool because the narrative is also like, Mr. Door realized he was being watched and said, all right, f*** her just this once. <laughs> <laughs> she also gets this page from Tim Breaker, who's also here. Uh, you know, it's, it's fine. He's just like sitting on a bench, too. He's just like chilling, like in the middle of the yeah. weird, dark place, rainy New York. And he's like, oh, hey, Zago, what's up? And she's like, nothing much, <laughs> Tim. What are you doing here? Here's this page about Mr. Door that I was going to hand you, like pretty much as soon as I disappeared. So have that. Saga gets that shoebox that has the bullet of light and the clicker in it, except instead of pictures, they're real this time, because it also sounds like Alice, like, is in the dark place somehow. Because, you know, if you go into the waters of Cauldron Lake, you don't really drown, you just kind of, you know, go to shitty New York. (laughs) You go to Alan Wake's Alex Casey, New York, which is a terrible place to be. Yeah, Saga... Gets through, gets through to the writer's room, basically, has a talk with Alan Wake about what they're going to do. And she's like, no, 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 you can't write the story by yourself anymore. You're bad at it. We are writing (laughs) this ending together. Let's sit down and plot this out, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) And this is the part where they're like, horror stories tend to have endings that are tragic for the hero because they have to make things happen for other people. This is how narratives function, children. (laughs) so they come up with a plan it basically involves pulling the dark presence out of alex casey back into alan wake and then saga shoots him with a gun (laughs) 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 this is actually where the original story ends is saga suits alan wake with a bullet made out of light and we get a mid-credit sequence where alice makes a video that is speaking directly to alan that said i didn't kill myself i didn't drown i went into the dark place to save you you're gonna have to keep doing this over and over again and slowly changing each time we've been through this a lot we're gonna go through it again it's not a loop it's a spiral dun 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 that's that's what's on the door and then you actually do new game plus which actually has new manuscript pages that talk about saga having a sense of deja vu there's different videos you can find that have dr casper darling in them who's just kind of wandering through the dark place and then he meets thomas zane and he's like oh hello ilka villa you look familiar hello matthew peretta you sound familiar (laughs) (laughs) let's hang out and then also you get an extended sequence out of the ending where saga calls logan logan picks up and she's fine and alan wake also wakes up and he's like the dark presence is gone and i have a bolt of light in my head and i am now the master of many worlds which I don't like. Boo. Oh, God. <laughs> Boo. Boo. And there's also, at the time of recording, two DLC scheduled to come out for Alan Wake 2, one called Night Springs and one called The Lake House. The Lake House being the name for the FBC monitoring facility they have there that you can't access in the main game. Terrific. Finally, they get to do something to Alan Wake, just like how he did something to them. Good. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Good. F*** up this little bastard's life. Yeah. And there we are. That's the whole Remedy interconnected universe. My head hurts. Yes. <laughs> well, maybe you should go listen to a Poets of the Fall song about it. <laughs> <laughs> That'll fix you right up. Straight up, though. The music sequences are the best parts of these. They're just fun. They're taking a second to say, hey, wait a minute, you're playing a video game. Let's enjoy this for a bit, huh? I love how in the first one, there's like the rock scene. They're like, it's just a cool rock song. And then there's like explosions killing guys and you're, you know, you're doing stuff. And then they're like, all right, we got to one up that. What do we do? But we can't do it in Quantum Break because we don't own that one. So they're not going to let they're not gonna let me do a musical number i'll save it for control and then they're like what if we do two actually and then now they're like what if we do two in this one too and they can never go back now i feel like every (laughs) single time there's got to be more and more musical numbers until they make just a full musical game they're just gonna have to keep upping the ante yeah Yeah. poets of the fall they're just having fun they're having fun with sammy's video games (laughs) (laughs) honestly the dream right like honestly the dream is you or one of your friends gets to do creatively whatever they want and they bring you along and you guys all just get to have fun forever seems like a pretty great time a rising tide in the baltic sea lifts all ships (laughs) (laughs) 
Ah, oh, I really enjoy these video games. I can't wait for more stupid bullshit. It's the same kind of itch that scratches for me of like Kingdom Hearts of stupid anime bullshit or like Tales <laughs> games. Yeah. It's like stupid anime bullshit for but instead of people who are raised on anime, it's people who are raised on Twin Peaks and Stephen King. Yeah, and like Moomin or something. <laughs> Control 2 has been announced, and like a multiplayer game set in Control called Condor has been announced, but they're... I'm very curious to see if that one actually happens or not. Yeah, I don't know. There was like a multiplayer thing in one of the Control DLCs, and it was not terribly fun. I don't know. Maybe they'll do something with it, but I, who knows? I just want Control 2. Control 2, though. Let me go hang out with Jessie, see if she's okay. Hope they at least put a window in, maybe, <laughs> into the oldest house. The thing about like... <laughs> Alan Wake 2, it's like, Alan Wake 2 is like every time a control thing happened, like an FBC thing happened, I was basically just pointing at the screen like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. It's Otzi. Hey. I know him. <laughs> That's my friend from work. Oh, we didn't even talk about the fact that there's a full 15 minute Finnish art house movie that you can just find in the video game. Yeah. Uh, it, we're at, th we, we are at three hours I and know. Half, 30 minutes. Too deep we can't. The pain. We oh, can't. It's not relevant. <laughs> it's just, we didn't even talk about that shit. These yeah. Stupid it's just, video games. It's so dumb. It's too deep in the pain to talk about Yotin Yo, the nightless night. <laughs> but here we are. We actually pretty much just scratched the surface here. There's so much bullshit in these. You should definitely play these video <laughs> games, you guys. And you do, unfortunately, have to read all of the papers that you find in every one of them <laughs> to get the whole story. <laughs> It's that kind of video game. It's time for final facts now. Okay, what's your final fact? I'm just going to keep standing by this. If you are a writer, don't write a story about a writer. Please, please, God, no, please stop. <laughs> Jake, what's your final fact? My final fact is that when you make plans, it is not God who laughs, but a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, what's your final fact? Make little video games with your dumb friends. <laughs> make little things with your dumb friends and you'll have a nice time and maybe someone else will too after 13 years <laughs> okay that is gonna do it for us here jake thank you so much for joining us where can folks find you you can find me i'm still on the bad website twitter oh, uh buddy. at jj underscore mation <laughs> i'm gonna you i'm gotta, gonna turn the lights gotta off stop i have decided that I, I've, I've dug my feet into sand and i will be there until they shut it down i will make it worse every day for elon <laughs> As God is my witness. I'm also on Blue Sky, Jake Mason, dot whatever the hell, uh, Blue Sky. I don't know how that one works. Bisky, Bisky dot social, I think. I don't Bisky remember. Bisky something. I'm there. Yeah. Less often, but still there. Then there's a bunch of podcasts. There's the Morphin Grid, which we are about to hit our 10 year anniversary on this next oh, week. Congratulations. Week from today. Thank you. We've watched so many Power Rangers at this point. <laughs> that's there there's kingdom smarts where shannon manor has 30 minutes at a time to explain kingdom hearts to me and i've never played the games i still haven't played the games but i have cried about fictional children just having a bad day and i don't want them to have <laughs> a bad day anymore and then there's pokemon world tour and united world tour is back there's no real focus we just talk about pokemon for a little while and then united should be back by the time this comes out oh hell getting yeah back on track yeah the problem is that alan's getting their doctorate and that takes up so much time so oh, we haven't yeah yeah that'll do it haven't had a lot of time to record, but semester is over and their next one is going to be easier. So we'll be able to finally like get back into stuff. So Fantastic. forward to that. Yay. Thanks for having me, y'all. Also, if you want to hear Jake edit things that Crooked Russian Cam people are on on the reg, he is also the editor for Gem Jam. Uh, Gem I, Jam. No, that show is over. I, I did Jam. do that, that one. <laughs> long over. <laughs> Although I did get someone commenting on my Limp Lizards fanfic the other day who was Wild. saying that they had listened through the entirety of the Gem Jam just recently oh. and then found my fic. Bless. That was really cool. People are still listening to that show and I'm very happy about it because nice. we worked hard on it. We did. We did work hard on that one. Wild. Those are other shows but this is this one <laughs> <laughs> okay i will fight you comes out every five weeks you can find it wherever you download podcasts it is edited by lucas brown of the math of you if you would like to support us just find us on the internet and say hi in some capacity that's always nice we're around we're on blue sky we're on the bad website but i don't really check that one but you can also just find us on crookedrussiancam.horse or crookedrussiancam.gay is our website where you can find information about I Will Fight You as well as our other shows, some of which are dead, but we still have things on there. Uh, money. You can give us money if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you want to? Don't you want to, baby? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, we patreon.com <laughs> slash the gem jam. Give us money. You can get early episodes of I Will Fight You and show notes and shit. And you can also get other stuff for our other shows as well, which are also good. Is that it? Did I do it? I think that's it. I think you got it. Okay. That seems like everything to me. Great. Go find Jake on places. He's very good. Yeah. We like him a yeah. lot. Oh, thanks. That is going to do it for us here. Join us next time. We'll have another fun fact for you that is absolutely true and you cannot argue with us about it. (laughs) Until next time, I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Jake. And we have fought you. There, I don't know who it was, but in the Kevin Smith version of <laughs> Superman, whoever the producer was like, yeah, and then we'll put a big mechanical spider fight. And he's like, oh, no. Oh, God damn it. And then they're like, okay, fine. And then in Wild Wild West, he's like, now we're putting a big mechanical spider fight. I'm getting it in a movie, God damn it. <laughs> As I recall, I remember Neil Gaiman also saying that the, the guy doing the Sandman movie, which was the same guy, wanted a big mechanical spider fight in that too so he he just had such a boner for a big (laughs) mechanical spider fight until next time on annie Eh, uh, i'm nope 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 (laughs) one more again until next time